You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Welcome once again to Truth, Justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Way. We are the podcast about New England wrestling. I am your host, Matt Spectro, a.k.a. Tarzan Taylor. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host. He's a former CTWE Tag Team Champion. And a man who the best concert he ever went to was Parkway Drive, Julian Starr. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? And I do recommend that anyone who is a metalhead... Go see Parkway Drive because they are a fantastic band. Uh, so that is a band. Yes, oh. yes, it's a metal band. <laughs> I thought it was a festival because I never fucking heard of the uh, really Parkway. Drive. I'll uh, I'll see if I can play something for you on the way home. But what's the best concert you've ever been to? It's a tough call. I've been to a lot of concerts. I'd say when I saw the Beastie Boys, that might be very high on the list. Really? Yep. Um, geez, I'm trying to think. Alice Cooper put on one hell of a show when I saw him. Oddly, years and years ago. I would never have thought it. Weird Al Yankovic put on one hell, <laughs> hell of a show. I saw Weird Al. You know, it's. Uh, I remember Brian Fury telling me how great Andrew WK show was. Yeah, he did tell me that too. I remember he's got some great songs. So yeah. if you can bring that energy to a stage show, I'm sure it would be a, a hoot. Um, yeah. All right. So, like I said, we are the podcast exclusively about pro wrestling in the New England area, the greatest area for professional wrestling in the country. Julian, as always. Give them a little bit more about what our show's about. Truth, justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Way is about trying to gain the truth and reality of New England professional wrestling. Most podcasts these days try to be a bit too political and a bit too friendly, but here at Truth, Justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Way, we are going ahead and try to break that mold, gain the answers to those hard-hitting questions. We'll dig, we'll probe, we'll do whatever it is that it takes to gain truth and justice in the New England Pro Wrestling Way. And this is episode 24, the feel-good episode, I'm going to call it. You know, we're going to try and uh, make everybody uh, happy, feel good, you know, with everything that's going on. I know this is uh, times where we all need to get a little bit of a pick-me-up. What do you think? I don't know. I don't really have an opinion. I mean, I agree. It's pretty downtime right now, and I think our podcast brings happiness to people, especially when people bring out the shovel. So we'll try not to be too uh, miserable to our guest. Um, WrestleMania, I haven't watched it yet. What do you think? Um, okay, so it's exactly what I thought. A lot of the matches were really hard to keep my attention because there was no crowd. Um, I'll tell you, I've never really seen a empty arena ladder match. Not exactly fun to watch <laughs> when there's no one there. You just Basically, you're watching people get hurt. Um, but I'll tell you the two matches that you really need to go see, especially if you're a fan of 80s wrestling, is the Firefly Funhouse match and Undertaker's uh, Boneyard match. Those are very old school, kind of, um, but just blatantly awesome. All right. Blatantly. All right. All right. Before we get through the uh, Feel Good episode, episode 24, are you ready for trivia? After last week's win... Absolutely, I'm ready for trivia. I feel like I'm going to dominate this question. For anyone new to the show, every week I ask Julian a trivia question relating to New England wrestling. And if he gets it wrong, we give our guests an opportunity to answer. Since this is the feel good episode, I went really easy this week. Oh, all right. Three men in the WWE, WWF's history who have won the world championship have either trained or were born and raised from New England. Name these three men. Uh, one is Triple H. All right. Also known as Paul Levesque. Let's see. The only man from New Hampshire to ever hold the WWF Championship. The next one. Oh, he's a WWE Hall of Famer, though. I didn't say Hall of Famer. Okay. I just said so, three uh, men. Okay. In the All history right. of the company. My mind is. Either the world, the Raw World Championship or the SmackDown or both. Three men that either trained or were born, raised from New England, have held that title. You already got Triple H. Yep. You got John Cena. Correct. And 
Kofi Kingston. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. <laughs> the guy from Chaotic was the one you had the hardest time. <laughs> well, it's hard because when you throw a trivia question at someone, that you're kind of put on the spot, and then my nerves start going, and I'm second guessing all my answers. Yes, the three men: John Cena, Triple H, Kofi Kingston. All right. The reason I was so specific because John Cena, to my knowledge, did not actually train. In New England, I believe he trained in California, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, he did, but I guess... But he was born and bred in Westbury, Massachusetts. That he was. And he did stop by here at Cabot. West Newberry. What did I just say? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but he did stop by here at uh, the what used to be the Catholic Training Center, now the New England Pro Wrestling Academy. And he, uh, the second ever in New England Championship Wrestling show I ever wrestled on. John Cena was on that show. Really? Yeah, wrestled the future. Frankie Kazarian. He was the prototype, I assume. He was the prototype. Okay. Huge. How was that match? Do you uh remember? I watched it. It was fine, but they did like they did everything, almost to the point where they killed their own crowd. Like. <laughs> That's pretty fucking amazing. <laughs> All right, we're getting on to this week's feel good episode. We don't really have a topic as much. We're just going to talk to a young and up and comer in the New England area. He is a former UCW Zero Tag Team Champion, a former UCW Zero Heavyweight Champion, a former Rocky Mountain Pro Heavyweight Champion, a former. FSW Tag Team Champion. He's a former heavyweight champion from Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. And he's the only guest we've ever had who has held the XWA Firebrand Championship. Whoa! Ladies and gentlemen, Tyler Syndrome. Hello. I, I actually appreciate this being the Feel Good episode. You know, I'm a big Motley Crue guy. One of my favorite songs is Dr. Feel Good. So I think that kind of all ties together. Wow. And that was not even planned, folks. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. I want to thank you and welcome you to the show. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you guys doing today? All good. Right. Good. All right. So we're just going to kind of see where the conversation takes us. We're going to talk a little bit about New England wrestling, what it's like up and coming, a little bit of your training, your journey. We're going to start. We always start, and I know you're an avid listener, so you know this. We start with a softball question. What point in your life was pro wrestling something you decided you were going to take a crack at? When Shawn Michaels kicked Marty Jannetty and tossed him through the barbershop window. <laughs> Ever since that point in time, I've never thought about being anything else other than Shawn Michaels. All right. I don't blame you. That is, the, uh, that is of all the barbershops moments, I would say that's the most... Uh, one everybody remembers. Julian, were you uh, watching wrestling when that had happened? No. I, uh, well, what year was that? God, it was in the 90s. Uh... Um, well, so I'm born in 89. It was late. It was late 91 going into 90. Okay, so yeah, as so. a two, so no. I, I don't think I actually discovered wrestling until I was like... I just remember my favorite moment is uh, they, they do the, the hand raise together and Bobby Heenan's like, well, they're the Rockers. And then he super kicks him and Heenan's like, oh, I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> So uh, at that point, you wanted to be a professional wrestler. Now, did you want to be just like Shawn Michaels? You wanted to be a heel, or uh, that's all I've ever wanted to be—is that heel? Um, <laughs> you know, that was really the one that gravitated. And then, obviously, you know, I'm like five in that time frame, and then you know, get a little bit, grow up a little bit to starting to become a young man and have that '97, '98 in your face, intense, over the top Shawn Michaels during that time was really the one that shaped and really like what i grasped and what i wanted to be in pro wrestling and then at that point um i have to assume you watched wrestling from that point forward and followed john michael's career yeah all the way to dx to you know everything really yeah i actually i, I didn't go to school for a few days after sean lost at wrestlemania 14 <laughs> <laughs> uh, i didn't i you know i was i was a very mouthy kid i'm sure that's not surprising to a lot of people that are tuning in um yeah i was uh, very adamant that sean was going to beat stone cold and you know probably never lose the championship. Little did I know that'd be the last time I'd see him for like four years. Well, outside of like the commissioner stuff. That's funny because that was my first WrestleMania ever televised that I got to watch. And I was a avid stone cold fan as I am today. And, uh, that's all I sat there with my, my fingers crossed. Just please for the love of God, beat Shawn Michaels. So when I was a happy little boy, you were, I, I was a, a sad, sad man. <laughs> <laughs> So I think you're going to be the first, uh, even though you are here in New England, in the New, Ang New England scene, you weren't born and raised in New England, correct? I was not. I was actually, so, you know, you talk about, like, wrestling and getting to know it. So I'm a small town Wisconsin kid. I grew up in a town with 500 people in it. So there was no access to, like, any type of wrestling school. All I knew was, you know, the Shawn Michaels school and actually Killer Kowalski, you know, because you're a DX guy and naturally you, know, you look at Shawn, you look at Triple H. Like they were kind of hand in hand with a lot of things. So um, 
when I got to college and, you know, starting to look at wrestling, I actually met a guy at a party. You know, I was dressed as John Cena of all people. It was just a quick, easy costume. Right. And he was dressed as Paris Hilton. Um, and he's like, <laughs> he's like, no, I'm training to do it. He's like, you should, you should come. And I'm like, yeah. So we went and saw a indie show in La Crosse, Wisconsin. That was at like a, a tight bar venue. I mean, it was, was that your first independent show ever? Well, second. Okay. And this actually, we could probably take a half step back because you guys have talked about charging for pictures before. And I was a kid, probably seven or eight, and it was in Turtle Lake, Wisconsin, which is about an hour and a half northeast of the Twin Cities. So we used to get a lot of old AWA guys that would come up there and do these casino shows. Well, Mr. Perfect's there, and I'm scared out of my mind to talk to him. Right? It's Mr. Perfect. You know, I think you guys know that's my kind of yeah, guy. Yeah. And I walk, my mom walks up to him. It's like, hey, you wanna, can you take a picture with my son? Didn't even say yes. Just grab me and put me in this headlock <laughs> and took a picture. So never going to charge for a picture on that. Um, so that would probably be the first one. I mean, Nails was there, kind of the, those older AWA guys coming back through. It was after Perfect left the WWF. Um, but like as an adult, I guess that would probably be the second one then. Uh, it was terrible. But Austin, <laughs> but Austin Aries was there, and you kind of knew who Austin Aries was. Yeah. So I eventually – I was like, yep, let's go train. But it was this guy that had a ring in his yard. And they immediately, they're like, okay, well, let's do a six-man tag match was like the first interaction in there. And I'm like, okay, this isn't what I'm looking for. Um, then eventually ended up um, reconciling with my dad um, and moving out to Salt Lake City, Utah, where he was. And then, you know, through the course of time was just, you, know, you guys will probably laugh at this and a lot of listeners may have heard this before. But it was WrestleMania 26 that really like lit that fire. So I will actually moved to Seattle for a few months, came back down and I actually followed an entire house show loop. So I bought house show tickets to Salt Lake city, Utah, Boise raw was in Portland on Monday. Smackdown was in Seattle on Tuesday. The, I want to say it was the two weeks out from mania 26. Cause I got to follow Sean. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, uh, and then <laughs> Ended up moving back to Salt Lake. It was like, okay, Sean's retired. I got to become that second reincarnation of Shawn Michaels. Like, it's time, <laughs> right? So I, I jump on Google, you know, pro wrestling schools in Utah. And as you can imagine, you know, not not a ton of hotbed stuff. No offense to anybody out there. I love you guys. You know, we're still going to be family forever. But um, I ended up jumping in and, you know, being a fan and being, you know, I was still Mark. You know what I mean? I love pro wrestling. Like, I knew everything about, like, the stages and the process to get to the WWE because I didn't want to do anything else. Um, so I found Martin Casals, who was then eventually on Tough Enough. He did Lucha Underground, but he had an FCW tryout. So I knew like that was the developmental territory at the time. Like that's where I wanted to be. And he was from your girlfriend's bedroom, so I was you know this kind of naturally like yes. Um, so I ended up finding UCW Zero there in Utah and enrolling in the school and breaking in there. Uh, to backpedal a little bit, um, I'm a little older than well, probably a lot older than you, but uh, I grew up a big. Uh, Big AWA fan. So you mentioned you're from Wisconsin. Was AWA something that you knew about or had watched? Uh, being that you know you were you were probably really young when they closed their doors. So I'm just curious if in that area AWA was still a like something everybody knew about. Oh yeah, at that time. Yeah, it was definitely still a thing, and that was like the draw for those casino type shows. Was getting a lot of those guys through. Like Ric Flair's first match was like a half hour from where I grew up. I remember reading his book. He's like, "Yeah, it was in Rice Lake, Wisconsin." Like, oh, I've been there. And then we go there all the time. And it was Ric Flair's first match up here. Um, but by the time, I mean, I was four or five in that nine, like when Sean kicked Marty through the window. So that was always the early stages. Uh, I do remember going to. WWF house show where Hulk Hogan was the champ. So obviously it's an earlier memory than that yeah. time frame. Um, so by the time, you know, Hulkamania was rocking, I mean, it was at the St. Paul Civic Center where the AWA used to run. So by the time I got into it, AWA was pretty much shot. And they were probably doing tapings in Vegas at that time. Yeah, because I think they closed their doors in either 90 or 91, if yeah. I remember so, correct. Just more, that was my own curiosity because I was a big fan of AWA as a kid. But. Now, we mentioned this on episode 23, but what was actually the first show you went to ever. It's probably that Hulk Hogan okay. show. We always say that he wrestled some guy or Ted DiBiase wrestled some guy named Mustard on there, but and I <laughs> so I and I know that can't be true, but I I've tried to look up the results from this house show so many times. But, you know, and we, the only two memories that I have is, you know, Million Dollar Man was there and obviously Hogan because, you know, you remember those types of pops and, you know, that type of, you know, hulking up. I mean, yeah, you remember yeah. that. So I'm thinking like the main event was probably Hogan and the Million Dollar Man. I just remember Million Dollar Man wrestling.
wrestling a guy in yellow trunks. All right. So you said you started training in Utah? Yep. Okay. And so uh, kind of describe, I know you said the first match was six man, but kind of like paint a picture for people. So what happened when you first walked in? So I first walked in, they had rent, rented a warehouse. What uh, year is this too? 2010. Um, and uh, at that time, I was tan. I was in shape. I looked the part. Like I was through and through. I was still five ten, but you know, I was. I looked the part. I looked look like a wrestler compared to others. Exactly. Yeah. So that kind of you know instantly bumped me up the food chain just by looks alone. You know, the evil owners like, yep, that's the new guy that I'm going to manage. <laughs> and you know, some of the top guys are like, okay, well, here's a new guy to work with. They had, you know, it was a strong Latin population out there. Paco was the mass Mexican hero. So he's like, oh, perfect. You know, we got a new villain to work with, um, you know, and it was just the basics, right? Um, we, I actually used to do left shoulder rolls, no right shoulder rolls until I got out here, believe it or not. Um, and taking flip bumps off of two feet, which we are currently working on uh, fixing. fixing. Yep. Uh, there's quite a few things that we're fixing, um, <laughs> like hitting the ropes, um, those kinds of things. Um, but it was just a natural athlete. So when, you know, we go in and we're just doing backdrops randomly one day and I'm landing those things perfectly fine. They're like, Oh, okay, well you're going to be on the next show. So I want to say it was probably May ish. I broke in and that first show was in early June. So I was within a month of taking my first bump, really being in a match. I mean, it was fully scripted five minutes, A to Z went over with the walls of Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> Had black and uh, had black trunks with lime green lightning on it too. Now you had mentioned we were off off mic, but you had mentioned something about training on a mattress. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> and slick, I love you to death. But uh, so I call the number, right? You know, so I find you know Martin was at FCW. You know, call this number, and you know he's like, hello, and you know I was like, hey, I'm interested in the wrestling school, and he's like, well, how tall are you? I'm like, oh, I'm five ten. He's like, well, how much do you weigh? I'm like, two hundred pounds. He's like, muscle or fat? And I'm like. Muscle. And he's like, be at this address at 6 p.m. on Tuesday. And I was like, all right. And I'm not too worried. I mean, I, I can handle myself if situations got sticky. I, that, that stuff doesn't scare me at all. So he literally, you know, he's like, well, I got a ring in my basement. And it's a good joke now, but they were eventually, they were transitioning into that building is why he ended up having it. Okay. It was just the time that I came in with it that it happened to literally just me. And you know, we're doing that. Like, I'm doing flip bumps on a mattress, essentially. I don't know what else he had down there. It's probably a bunch of pillows and blankets, you know, the makeshift ropes. Actually, I can probably find a picture of it for those that would want to see it. So hit me up if you want to see those pictures. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then we just did those basics, you know, chained a little bit. Um, told me to come back on Thursday. I was back on Thursday, and then um, – and so Paco, the mask dude, the reason he wears a mask is he's got a glass eye, and it never really sits. So I, he's got a – he just comes down in the basement and doesn't say anything on the second day. So I'm like, I got this old dude. I'm in his basement. I got this goofy dude with like a googly <laughs> eye over here looking at me. I'm like, what am I getting myself into? And still to this day, like I keep in contact with both of those guys. You know, like Paco got to work Rey Mysterio eventually, you know, so that'd be like me working Sean, you know. So uh, just those happy, feel-good moments. And Slick has done a ton of favors for me getting, you know, plugged into different areas throughout the West Coast there. So it was uh, kind of a, a funny start that literally only happened to me. But I always thought that I, I always thought that was great uh, how I got my start in the basement of Steve Slick's house. And you feel um, like you took to it right away. This is something like, yeah, this is definitely what I want. And this is what I expected. Or was it big was, adjustment? Was there any for point it? of self-doubt? No. At that point in time. Not at all. I mean, imagine I, if you, the way you describe it, if they're like putting you on shows right off the bat, to me, that would almost build you confidently, like right yep. off, the, yeah, right out of the gate. Oh, yeah. Almost maybe to your detriment sometimes with certain people. And I was just going to say, might not have been the best thing in, you know, hindsight. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, learning patience and like, I'm not going to be able to ascend to the top of the card everywhere I went because it was, I mean, we had a rumble. Uh, shortly thereafter, and you know, beg and plead, got to be the first one in and the last one eliminated, right? <laughs> That's a Sean spot. Uh, yeah, I mean, my head got really big really quick because you know you see all these different people come in, but at the same time, from the business perspective of them running a wrestling company, you have a guy that you, know, you could put on a poster that's going to turn some heads, you know, and 
looks the part and has all your top guys that want to sink their teeth into something new and that's you know the new guy but there was no there's no I don't want to call it negative, but there was no Brian Fury, like giving you directive straight feedback on what you need to correct. You know, I was getting back through the curtain off after that first match. and Oh my God, dude, that was so awesome. You're so good. <laughs> and that's, you know, you talk about differences and why I firmly stand with you that new England is the best you know, independent territory because you get that direct feedback and you have that type of competitive level out West that literally like I was told how good I was from the second I walked in to like the second I moved out here. It's where you say that. And uh, I want to say, ha, he agrees with me. Um, <laughs> it's been a common theme with some guests head. that we've discussed or talked about where a lot of times if, if you're, if it's too nice and too complimentary and no, too soon, it develops problems sometimes down the road. Some people, don't get any better because of it. Some people just, it's not that they're getting better, they get an attitude, and it's been common with, not a lot of people, but I've heard it a lot of times with, whether it be, a lot of times it's commonly women because the promoter and half the boys want to sleep with them, so they're never going to say anything wrong. So it's, I do feel that, but the thing is, on the flip side, and I'm, I'm rambling a bit here, is uh, it's a good lesson to other people is that the first thing when you step into wrestling is they're going to look at you they don't know anything about you, but they're going to look at the way you look. Like, you were in shape. You're you're probably tan. Decent looking guy. Like, automatically that resonates because that's the first thing you see about any wrestler is the way they look. So, I'm going to stop rambling. <laughs> it's just a lesson for people. I'm trying to get to the point that yeah. it's a good thing to get across to people that, like, doors open for you right off the bat because of the fact that you looked like a wrestler. You looked in shape. You looked like an athlete. And would you say that were you the only person training, or was there a class at this point? So, I mean, there was a class um, of students, right? Some started before me, some started after me. People would come in, they'd fall off. I mean, you've, yeah, Julian, you, revolving yeah. door. Um, so there wasn't like, oh, there was like four of us that came in, I guess. The only other person around that time frame was, I don't know, I'm sure you guys probably follow like the the trash bag wrestler Facebook stuff. I've heard that, yeah. and seen some stuff. Yeah. So there's a guy on there that was like the wrestler that was on Mari that had to have a lie detector test about cheating on his wife. <laughs> Didn't even know. That's, about that. that's like the only other guy that broke it around <laughs> that same time that would carry like national relevance. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was, it was quite the class me and you know, guy that ended up being featured on Mari. Um, but yeah, it, there was nothing like, you know, really coming through, like when we run class, you know, we got a beginner's ring, we got an advanced ring. It would kind of just be all of us at once in one ring doing drills, but we would kind of grab each other where, you know, the top guys would want to work with me to, you know, help me. Like I remember Martin, you know, pulling me to the side, teaching me shoulder tackles. And here we are all these years later, Chase is teaching me how to take shoulder tackles again properly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was, uh, I don't want to say there wasn't like a set, like, we didn't do like, okay, just go do a quick shine or, you know, let's see a, a baby face comeback. Like there was none of that, that we would get out here to really like break down and segment the match. We would you know, do rolls, we'd warm up, we would do some blow up stuff, you know, and get some cardio in and then probably just jump right into matches. I don't remember exactly the formula of foundation, mostly because I probably thought my shit didn't stink and I really didn't need to pay attention. You know, I'm going to win the championship, you know, pretty quick and be the top dog in Utah. And that's going to carry me right to FCW guys. I mean, come on, what else are you going to so at what point from that training did you start moving on? Um, so I started getting out to Colorado probably within a year. Um, and then, well, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, I know it's a mouthful. We use CWFH <laughs> is what we used to call it on Twitter. Um, it, was kind of a, it was kind of a hotbed. Like, it wasn't crazy, but it was television. It was national exposure. Their foundational core guys were good. You know, Joey Ryan, Colt Cabana was there. Uh, Adam Pierce was the NWA champ. Scorpio Sky, Willie Mack, Brian Cage, Sean Ricker, Eli Drake. Those were the guys that were there at the time. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I got to get there to get better because you know, I knew Brian Cage was in developmental. You know, you know who all these guys are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to get there and get my name in that hat. So I eventually started flying myself to and from California for those opportunities. I had a good day job. So okay. that like, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't breaking the bank. I mean, I was living okay. in my dad's spare room, yeah. making really good money. So it's like, oh, yeah, I was staying in nice hotels too. <laughs> it was actually pretty fun. Wow. 
All right, so um, you were booked, though. Like, you weren't just flying and hoping I'll get a shot and then... Uh... No, I was booked. So my second match ever was against a girl, and her name is Michelle Morgan, and I love you if you're listening to this. Thank you for listening. Um, she actually taught me a lot. Like, she was one that pulled me aside a few times and was like, okay, like, yes, you're good, but you need to work on these things, and these people will help you. So we're now husband, Navajo Warrior, who's been around for a long time as well, um, ended up getting me connected there in... Hollywood and giving that opportunity. So I got a dark match, essentially. You know, they're filming four episodes of TV. I was on in five minutes, put some guy over. The next month, I'm beating people in three minutes and cutting a 30 second promo about why my name belongs on the marquee and a championship around my waist. Because if there's one thing I can do, and I appreciate you giving me the nod, I can cut a promo. So you uh, sound like you've, uh, you're moving up. I, went, I don't know if moving up's the right word, but you're progressing pretty fast rate getting on to some high profile shows getting some tv exposure yep. get, getting like promo time you're getting so it sounds like it's going well i mean is any any negative stuff coming at this point in time the only negative thing was the pay you know i think it's been discussed a few times on this show other wrestling podcasts about yeah you can you can make pretty good money doing this stuff now in 2013 ish no <laughs> no you could not um it was literally just bleeding money because even if I was getting paid for shows, it's 40 bucks at the most, but that's a $300 flight, you know? And like I said, I wasn't staying in cheap hotels. It was on my own dime and mm-hmm. eating that, you know, I it was two flights a weekend sometimes. I'd go to Denver and back on Fridays and then wrestle in Salt Lake on Saturdays and then fly to California on Sundays. Like that would be a $1,000 expense out of my pocket <sighs> over the weekend just to continuously try to get those opportunities. All right. Was there uh, was there any point during your time when you started going to Colorado and doing all these other shows? Was there ever a point that you got feedback in in the back of your mind? Were kind of like shut the fuck up. You don't know what you're talking about. No. See, that's the thing is, I was you know there was it was always how good I was, and it was and now you know looking back on it, it was good into relation as to what was there. I didn't want to be good in. Denver and Salt Lake City. Like I wanted wanted to get to FCW. You know what I mean? Like that was the yeah. only thing that was in my mind was how do I get there? And I actually ended up doing one of those paid I paid fifteen hundred dollars to go down there for a four day tryout one weekend. Uh like that's that's how bad I wanted it was I was just bleeding money to get that opportunity. At what year was that that you transitioned into that? Uh the FCW gig? Yeah. The uh, that would have been t- 2011 so it was wow. yeah, i was green i was green as goose shit yeah, as, you said you about 2010 is yep. when you jumped in yep so 2011 wow you were yeah you're pretty green but god damn you're ambitious well, i had a look and at that time they weren't signing the uh, the indie darlings yet it was no. just all guys that had promised there wasn't like i think they had like cm punk and that was like the only like indie right. guy that was really signed i, I think in my mind. So I wanted to get there like before that, you know what I mean? Like I wanted them to look at me like, okay, the guy's got a ton of potential. We're going to lock him up and sign him right now. So that way he's going to be our next Shawn Michaels. Yeah. <laughs> what did you take away from that camp? Uh, Dr. Tom coaches a lot like Brian Fury. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it was direct feedback. I mean, it was a, it was a four day just learning. And honestly, some of the coolest experiences, dude. I got to cut a promo in front of Dusty Rhodes and get feedback. <laughs> you know how awesome that was? Yeah. He's like, that was good, baby, but you just got to make me feel it. You just got to make me believe it, baby. Um, actually got to meet Juice Robinson there, who we've kept in contact with over the years. And when the time is right, uh, we'll, we'll figure out a place to finally have that match. I don't think I'm quite up there to be able to hang <laughs> with that type of competitor. Um, you know, being able to just get feedback about gear change and fire from Ricky Steamboat, you know, that's sitting in my brain still. Um, you know, Norman Smiley teaching me about, you know, ring positioning and those kinds of things. So it was like a 40 crash course of the things that I actually needed at that time, as opposed to just getting told how good I was. Like even Dr. Tom shitting on my footwork <laughs> was like one of the things that stood out. Um, just giving a top wrist lock. Like, who oh, fuck drained you and broke you in? Oh, you're doing a shit wrong. And I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> so you'd say that just encouraged you even more to keep going, that yep. you were on the right path. Yeah. See, I try to tell people all the time. I, I feel like students are too sensitive nowadays. 
I, I always took, I was the same as Tyler Cintron, is I always took that negative feedback, took it as, okay, I'm going to prove you wrong, motherfucker. Yep. Uh, I feel like there's too many sensitive people now. Well, when Mark Sherman was on our show, he'd said, if they don't give you shit, it means they don't care about you. That is and true. I think you might be on to something like uh, the criticism a lot is because they see something or they think you could be better than you are. Now, not to take away from anything you did, but we are a New England podcast, so we're going to fast, fast forward. Perfect. To New England. At what point did you decide I'm going to hit the New England area? So I, w- I was done, uh, ready to you know get married. We got two dogs. We're going to do Boston. Um, go ahead. I just want to say uh, um, before we jump into that, okay. I just want to know what was the end result of your FCW thing because I believe you made a comment to me about we already have something. Oh. <laughs> that came later. You know, squeaky tire gets the gets the grease, right? <laughs> so actually at that tryout, Steve Kern told me, he's like, stop watching Rick Rude, Kurt Henning, and Ted DiBiase. Okay. I'm an 80s wrestling fan. I mean, I love that. So he's like, no, go watch Sheamus and Miz and Ziggler. And I already love Miz and Ziggler for the obvious reasons, but... I think it was right before FCW shut down. Like, I kept banging on the door, banging on the door, banging on the door. And he goes, kid, we already got a Dolph Ziggler, and we don't need another one. (laughs) All right. I just really wanted to get that in there. All right. (laughs) All right. So how did you transition into New England? What was the starting point for you? So uh, moved out here was took a couple of years off, right? It was, you know, just kind of realized that it might not be in the deck for me and just being a local independent wrestler wasn't where my heart was at the time. Um, you know, I know who Anthony Green is. I think, you know, because he's been out west, a similar name in similar circles. He was kind of doing some coast-to-coast stuff too. You saw that retro gimmick. I'm like, this is awesome. You know, when he came out with that, I'm like, this is so cool because I'm a big 80s everything fan. 80s hair bands, 80s wrestling. Like, I swear to God, it never got past the point of 1989. It just continued to, like, evolutionize as a human being. Um and I actually got hit up by um, Utah that was like, hey, we got an anniversary show. Uh, Deacon of Doom is going to be their champion. You know, he's a little bit older in age. You know you are, and I know you're listening. <laughs> uh, but they needed somebody to come in and you know put him over and work that style of match, you know, because a lot of kids that are coming up, you know, they want you know they want PWG and a five star Melter rating. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not my style. Never has been. Never going to be. So you know, I needed to get reps and some hitting up Fury on social media and he's not responding, <laughs> not responding. Um, I went down to XWA and worked out with Matt Taven one day cause I've known him for years and you know, that was fine and dandy. Uh, but I actually knew Wally, um, big tall yeah, skinny they, yeah, yeah. from, uh, from the day job at lifetime fitness. So oh, he shit. worked in the basketball and, you know, so we always talked about coming up here and, you know, I knew AG trained here. And again, it's a Kowalski school thing. You know, we double back to, you know, what I looked at before I even left Wisconsin. Um, Finally, finally got in here the first day. Um, me and Fury just chatted quick and sent me in the beginner's ring. Um, and that had been, yeah, it was February of last year. Um, Ricky Archer gave me a headlock takeover and dumped me right on my head. <laughs> he still apologizes to me for that to this day. And I'm like, dude, it's entirely okay. And He's I'm like, I'm just, sorry. I still yeah. haven't gotten better. Um, so, you know, I went and, you know, just, I just wanted to get ring time. You know, I wanted to get some reps back. I wanted it to be good for my friend in Utah who I've gotten along with for years. You know, he's a big horseman guy. I love Tully Blanchard, all that old school wrestling stuff. Um, and then it all kind of bit again. And honestly, it was listening to Fury's feedback, you know, not just to me, but just like how the entire thing is ran. It's just there's nothing that's acceptable except great professional wrestling. It's not even good. Like he wants it to be the best and just starting to wrap my head around it and think about it and all of the different ideas and angles, not even like pro wrestling stories, but like coaching in the ring was really that, like it lit that fire again. It's like, okay, like even though yeah, I might, might not ever make it, I can still like be a quality pro wrestler and be around quality pro wrestling again. Um, so yeah, I was definitely <laughs> don't want to give the devil his due, but Fury's feedback was really kind of what drew me back into it and made me want to start going again. So it wasn't at that point it went beyond just you were getting ready for this one match. You yeah. wanted to now become active in New England again. Yeah. And what were your first impressions of uh, New England scene in as, in general? Well, I mean, chaotic wrestling has carried a lot of weight over a lot of years. Like I've known what chaotic wrestling is ever since I've broken in. You know. Uh, I was going out for the countdown last year, making my debut. Like I was, I was a little bit weak in the knees. 
You know, because I, I know the people that have been through that curtain and, like, the standard that's set from that. It was the first time I saw you, and I've never really said this to anyone, but I bitched to Tarzan the whole fucking next day that you had the biggest pop in the goddamn <laughs> countdown, and... <laughs> I remember this. God damn it, Chase. You didn't hear that pop and think to yourself... Let me make this fucking kid bump the shit out of me. Get over huge. Get this fucking kid over. They Everyone beat the shit out of you because you were new. And I f- was so fucking angry because I was like, holy shit, this dude's getting a great reaction. They should have been putting you over huge. Like, I would have... I don't know. I'm, I'm fucking ranting, but I was. I remember rant this. Rant away, rant away. I rant remember away. this, and I was. I bitched to Tarzan the next day, and I said, "God damn it, this kid! I've never seen him, but Tyler sent you on. Must you must have brought friends? I don't give a shit. You got a great crowd reaction, and to me, like I kept saying, I wish I was in that fucking rumble because I would have said, bump me until I get fucking tired of getting up, just so it makes you look like a million dollars, so we can get a huge crowd reaction, get you over. Well, what was. What's funny is, you know, the list of accolades, you know, I came in and I'm like, okay, well, I'm Tyler Cintron. You know, you be working the main event here against JT Dunn. You guys are lucky I came in here. So I'm talking to Chase and Fury, you know, like going down the accolades. And I remember Chase going, like, I don't, I don't even know who that is or where that is. <laughs> so that kind of like, you know, knocked me down a few pegs. Um, I'm going into the, the countdown, essentially, you know, so like the time frame of, Dedicating back to it, you know, what does that look like in first impressions of the scene? Um, I did. I bought a ticket to one of the shows in Woburn, which I feel like I'm kind of intertwined to Woburn now forever. <laughs> um, and I just I sat there as a fan and watched it, and I'm like, this is really good, head to toe. Like, this isn't just, you know, indie dream matchups where you're giving guys 15 minutes and go do whatever you want. Like there's substance there means something. I saw it was Verna and Brandon Locke screaming F bombs at each other. And I'm like, this is awesome. I want to do this so much. And then it was, uh, the night that AG had, um, the retrospective with yep. fury was on it. Uh, or like chase came out and cut him off. Yeah. And I'm like, Excuse me, mullet uh, and cowboy boots? It was like, <laughs> so I'm like, I understand them. Like, this guy clearly sees Shawn Michaels like I do. Um, but yeah, so the moment Fury came out, AG cut his hair, set up for Colt Fury, and I'm like, okay, cool. There's like, there's substance here. And, you know, again, I knew what chaotic wrestling was prior, and I knew like the standard that got set with it. So, you know, finally ate humble pie for the first time probably in my entire career, you know, by the time I got out here. And, going into that countdown was like you know it was february to june for me to make my debut when i i'm just instantly booked everywhere that i go i'm like i don't get it uh but during that time uh it was awesome you know um ag was a big help to me in the beginning big help got me plugged back in uh to a few different spots helped me get in at uh ncw and um got to work uh zach pierre lebeau that night and we had a fun little eight-minute match, and kind of same thing as the countdown. A lot of my coworkers went, had a lot to drink, you know. And we went out there and did that. Um, you know, started hitting up XWA on Thursdays, and you know, eventually some of the guys from the school, like you know, got to know Ricky Archer and Charlie Cashew quite a bit, and it's awesome to watch their progression go too. That's like super cool just to watch them from dropping me in my head in the beginners ring to everything <laughs> that Archer can do now, um, and just. You're getting that time on the road with the guys, you know, because I've never had that as much because, again, I was in Utah flying myself everywhere. You know, I wasn't, oh, we're going to Providence and back on Thursdays and then Fridays we're in Lawrence and then Saturdays we're doing APW and then Sundays AG's got a show. So there was none of that like home base, if you will. It was always like jumping on a plane and going places, um, which was kind of a cool thing that I've never had before until now. Now, people have said in the past that uh, chaotic wrestling specifically um, has two kind of uh, images to itself, and that's it's clicky and egotistical. Would you say you share the same opinion or... Do you have a different take? I don't. I don't think it's clicky. I think you know. Obviously, if they're meeting the New England Pro Wrestling Academy guys, probably because we all train together, we know each other. You know what I mean? Like, so you'll see you go in the locker room anytime. You might see me, Mortar, you know, Archer, and Cashew sitting there talking because you will kind of were that next crop of students that came yeah. through. You know what I mean? So maybe that's it. Um, egotistical i think is justified why wouldn't it be you know look at the names that have come through and you know 
go to a show. Why would you not have a little bit of an ego or a chip on your shoulder about how good your performance is and just that expectation of being able to perform at that level too? So when you came in, um, even though you had a lot of experience, a lot of the other students probably saw you as a student because they didn't know who you were. Would you say any bad feelings, any resentment, or were you like, welcome with open arms right off the bat? Um, I don't feel like there was any resentment, but I also don't feel like I was welcome with open arms at the same time. I think a lot of people when I first started out were like, you've done this before somewhere. I think Johnny Vegas was always like, yeah, you kind of took those first few bumps. We're like, oh, okay, he's been in a ring before. Because again, like I went through my accolades yeah. and they didn't care. So I was like, okay, well, what do I, <laughs> like, so what do, I do? You know, so I didn't want to rub anybody the wrong way. I mean, I did that long enough naturally. And I was like, if I'm <laughs> going to, you know, if I'm going to do this, like, let's do it the right way. But as far as like the first time I felt like accepted into that family was we did a what show, one of JT shows in Providence. Um, I banged up my knee doing a rolling zigzag. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Athletic movements. Um, And I banged up my knee, and, you know, mortars hitting me up that night. Like, bro, what's, you know, and mortars super intense off of it, being that first interaction I had. So I started on Tuesday. You went through class, whatever, came back on Wednesday and didn't know that we get started. You know, not exactly. You know, there's nobody here at six. You know, so mortars here, like, building the stage. I've never met him before, and I walk in. He's like, "What are you doing here?" You know, yeah. I'm like, "Well, I'm here for class." He's like, "You been here before?" Yeah. No, he's like, "You signed the paperwork." I'm like, "No." He's like, "I right, somebody will be in a second. You know, like the thick accent." That's a They're really like, good order <laughs> brush. He's like yelling at me it's already. Deep Boston accent. <laughs> I love it. Um, no, but he was hitting me up that night about my leg, and I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, just kind of like tweaked it. I think it should be okay. Like nothing significant." When I visited the doc, he was like, "It's like it's really cool of you checking up on me. Like, thank you, I appreciate that." I was like, "Yeah, man, you're, like, you're one of us." So that was like the first time where I was like, "Awesome!" Like, here we go. So from that point, it kind of, you know, I don't want to say that I'm like big brother in anybody, but if I can help somebody not make all of those mistakes that I did, uh, I think that would be beneficial. Being an adult now, I, I realized that when people didn't treat me the same way that others did. So in your case, you have all these accolades and people, you tell people over here and they're like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Nor do I give a shit. Um, when I, that happened to me elsewhere, back in my mind, I was like, fuck these guys. <laughs> did you ever have that feeling over here in new England in any way, shape or form? No. Honestly, really? yeah. stayed humble the whole time. Yeah, uh, five six years ago, it might have been a little bit different, um, but I also think it's justified, right? You know, because again, I mean, if I don't have thirty of my friends in the crowd at the countdown, you hear crickets. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, "Who is this guy with the pink spandex with the hands on the butt?" Well, I do hear a lot of times nowadays that a lot of guys don't want to get signed to WWE for the reason that WWE flat out tells them when they get to NXT and the, the Performance Center that. They don't give a shit what you've done in the past. It's great. It's going to help you here, but you're basically starting over. Um, I've heard that before, and so I hear that that's why some people don't want to get signed over there. Um, give it to me. I'll get signed right now. <laughs> get told what to do. Yeah, that's basically where I was going with this. I didn't know if uh, that was something that was going to start to discourage you and make you think like – Fuck New England, like... No, I mean, it, it might have been different if I walked into a different school where, you know, because there's a lot of places where I probably would be the best person in the room. I think being, you know, in this building specifically, in the chaotic locker room, I'm not, like, on this, at this very moment, I am not the best person in that locker room. So I think that was where the humbling came from was, okay, like, you know, I want to be able to go toe-to-toe with JT. Like, I want AG to, you know, hit up Fury and be like, I want to work with Cintron. Like, that's you know the level that I want to get to to help continuously elevate myself as opposed to, you know, just being the top guy in a random VFW show in Southern Mass or Western Mass that's not really attractive to me anymore. You think uh, Brian Chase, Johnny V had anything complimentary to say? Or was it all, like, just, you know, really direct, these are the things you need to work on? It was pretty direct. Uh, uh, Johnny Vegas is a little bit softer around the edges than the <laughs> other two. Um, Chase did a lot of film sessions with me and really, you know, just little things, right? Like that's where he notices I take hip tosses wrong and <laughs> just naturally from so many bad reps. Like I remember sending him messages on Twitter like, hey, can you watch this match? And then I get like three or four like scrolling pages <laughs> worth and I'm like, what? <laughs> of just, you know, little things. Um 
I don't need compliments, to be quite frank with you. I think I'm kind of over getting told how good I am after hearing it for so long, where it's like, I don't. Like, I, at this point in my career, you know, through the roads that I've been down and the matches that I've had, I know what I do good and what we need to stay on. Uh, I just need that corrective feedback. It was mm-hmm. actually talked about comeback drills once. Uh, we were doing that here and did the Ziggler comeback, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, few bumps, finger splash, neck breaker, fire, um, and Fury just goes, pretty good. And I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like waiting for something else, right? Like, I'm like, and? And he's like, get the fuck out of the ring! <laughs> All right, so um, compared to, you know, out west, what do you think of the biggest differences, like booking, training, crowds, like out here in New England compared to other places? So the big one that jumps out is the boys. So... Out here, they'll be direct to your face and tell you exactly what they think. In Hollywood, Julian, you're so great, man. I love working with you. It's so awesome. Tarzan, man, don't book me with that piece of shit anymore. That guy fucking sucks. Don't bring him back. You know what I mean? Like, there was a lot of that out west. And it it was either just, oh, good, 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 or just burying people behind the back. And I just, that's not, that was more of a California thing of the talking behind people's backs. And, you know, maybe it was just because some, cocky kid came in and got a push talk about my push jr's podcast love that (laughs) um but that would be the biggest difference is you know i feel like you know ag gave me a little bit of love to get me going because he knows that i bring something to the table but at the same time you know if i'm getting better that's going to motivate other people to want to get better because they just want to be the competitive best you know what i mean like you see Somebody like JT just going out there and burning it down every single time he goes out. And, you know, him and Christian had some of those matches last year. I was like, like just blown watching them. It's like, okay, I want to get to that level. But I also know how those two are where they're like, great, you can work your ass off, but we're always going to be one step ahead of you. And if I can get to that level, they're going to work even harder. So that way they're staying at the top of the rung. I think that's the main difference out here versus out there. Now, is the feedback and all that stuff that you're talking about right now back in the west coast is that does it come unsolicited or solicited and same question for new england uh the feedback with the boys or like yeah, training just like the boys because you said like the boys are very different compared to there and here like oh, so the solicited unsolicited i think in some of those locker rooms they would see that i was like okay well this is like the new guy that all the top guys want to work with so i gotta tell him he's good and be like buddy buddy with him was kind of the vibe that i always got there like i Never really sought feedback out from certain people. Um, Like in Utah, I would go to my buddy Derek, who's awesome. Like he's probably the best person I've ever been in the ring with. And that's not an insult to anybody. That's just like a compliment to how good he is. I would take his insight and feedback. But, you know, there's 10 other people who just be like, oh, you're so great. You're so great. You're so great. But even the level of detail that Derek would give me is like nowhere near like what Chase would give me off of a five minute match. And I would work Derek for a half hour and get feedback. Um, so it's just that it's that attention to detail, the things that matter the most, because we could go out there. We could do an arm drag shine. I can do some shitty cut off, work some heat, give you a hope, eat shit. You come back, take it home somehow. You know what I mean? I th- feel like that's so overdrawn and overdone like a lot of people can do that it's just the details of like more layers to that foundational of pro wrestling like even out here i'm like i sometimes my brain just gets stuck and fury laughs because he sees the look on my face when i'm overthinking things where i'm like oh my god a shine just isn't a headlock takeover and then reversing it a few times into a few arm drags and the heel powdering and then cutting the baby face off i'm like no, it's actually an interaction of a heel and a baby face wrestling each other, and then something happens where the heel is in control, and then everything settles. The only other time I had that was when I had way too many drinks with Roddy Strong one night in Vegas. That was the only other time we talked about the absolute ways and flows. Not a lot of recollection of that night, though. Now, with you comparing the boys from the West Coast to the East Coast, do you get a lot of feedback from guys who are not necessarily high in the food chain? And what I mean by that is uh, obviously you're going to have your trainers, Chase, Brian, you know, give you feedback and stuff. But do you honestly have, do you have people like Mortar or DL just randomly being like, hey, real quick? Um, do you have people like Richard Holiday being like, hey, real quick? You know what I mean? Like, do you have even someone like, you know, your peers just being like, hey, I saw you do this. I don't know if that's legit. You know what I mean? Yep. 
Or uh, ab- you- yeah, so a lot of the boys will come out because they know at, at this point, especially mm-hmm. if they're you know guys from here, they know exactly what I need to work on and like the moments and where like where I'm at in training, where my mind's at, like why I'm doing things, as opposed to just hey brother, come here, you know. Uh, I think mortar's never scared to give a little feedback, which is why I love mortar. Um, <laughs> I've established a pretty good relationship with Cashew and Archer, so those guys are some of the first ones to jump out and be like, "Hey, like you know, uh, was that match against TJ Stinger Splash Neckbreaker?" He's like, "That's where the fire is. That's where you give it." I'm like, "Oh yeah, babyface stuff." <laughs> kind of <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> the only reason why I ask is because you also stated like a lot of guys on the West Coast will talk behind your back. Do you know for a fact that people on the East Coast aren't doing it? Because I can tell you that's untrue. I don't know, and it doesn't bother me if they are. Yeah. Uh, but now, I also feel like they would say it to my face. How do you feel? Well, yeah, possibly. <laughs> uh, depends on who you're talking to. Um, now, I believe in, uh, and I learned this throughout years, is I find it douchey if someone just comes up to me. Like, how would you feel if we walked by and, like, I know you, and I went, hey, Tyler, I don't like that hat. Looks like shit. And I walked off. You'd be like, didn't fucking ask you, asshole. That's how I feel feedback is. Do you get that same feeling, or do you just don't care who you are come tell me what what's up yeah if, if you want to take time out of your day to come give me feedback great but uh like a same thing i told cashew and archer when they were first getting their first reps at xwa it was like you listen to chase and fury above all <laughs> like those that's the feedback that you want to have you same thing like if you're there give them feedback um you know vegas pulled me aside a few times after a match to go over a few things after uh, it was a Memphis spot that we did, and it just didn't work. And Sonny grabbed me and was like, yes, this is why. I mean, if you want to come give me feedback, I'll take it. But there's certain levels of people that I'm going to listen to. If Brian Fury tells me something, I'm going to listen to that tenfold. Some other people maybe take it with a grain of salt, you know. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to help, I appreciate it. But, you know, got to know where you fall on the totem pole a little bit. And that's why I kind of sit back with a lot of feedback too, because I'm still not quite sure where I am on that totem pole or the food chain of new England wrestling. Some people will ask definitely, but I'm not, I'm personally not going out of my way to give feedback. I'll give you advice because I rubbed a lot of wrong, uh, a lot of people the wrong way for (laughs) unsolicited being like, let me give you some advice because I trained at a great school. And so I rubbed a lot of people the wrong way because I acted like I know better. Um, if someone don't ask, don't give. It's, yeah. it's the best way you can do in wrestling because of the egos and shit in wrestling. You have no idea how someone's going to take your approach. You're in your head. I'm going to help this guy out. I think I got an idea because you're really, like I said, you're a great promo. If I'll tell you right now, honest, swear to God, if I was wrestling tomorrow and you said, let me go tell Julian how to cut a better promo, I'd listen to you. Because I've seen you cut promos and I'm like, I can fucking believe what he says. And you sound believable. You sound good. You speak well. I would not actually get mad at you for that. But if you came up to me and was like, ah, let me give you some feedback on your wrestling. Back in my mind, I'm like, Fuck shut you. the fuck up. <laughs> Didn't ask you. Didn't ask you. So, and that's the stuff I feel like that I rubbed people the wrong way. So if no one comes and asks, don't tell. If they want to come ask, then they'll value your opinion. And that's my opinion. Uh, on the sloth subject, but you think there's any difference in the crowds out west as opposed to the New England crowd? Uh Nothing crazy. Uh, I feel like a lot of fans, and this just might be because it's you know a few years removed, but a lot of fans like want to be a part of the show. You know what I mean? Like you're a fan. When I go to a Celtics game, I'm a Celtics fan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on the Boston Celtics. You know what I mean? Um, it could be like that. I mean, there was uh, a few people out west that were like that that were you know wanted to be reporters or whatever. Yeah. But I always kind of feel like the I guess the curtain was up on that, but out here I feel like a lot of fans want to be like a part of the wrestling show. And I mean, you can harass me on the internet all you want. I don't care. Like I really don't (laughs) bring it. If you want to get in a tussle with me on Twitter, I invite you. Um, But I, you're, you're a fan. Like, and that's okay. You know what I mean? Like I'm not going to go to a WWE show and try to sabotage it. Like, you know what I mean? It's just part of the game. Like play your part. You're a fan. Boo, cheer, whoever you want. Now, um, are there, I guess, the believability of fans in the West Coast and, you know, Utah and all that stuff, are they, do they believe wrestling a little more like the 80s style, like, uh, I believe it, or are they now, are they more like New England fans where they're like, I'm in on the joke, I'll play along? Yeah, I feel like uh, collectively wrestling fans are in on the joke, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm going to cheer 
in this part, I'm going to boo this guy. But at the same time too, like that dynamic of the baby face change with stone cold, you know what I mean? Like he's the heel. Like he, I have debated this with people for the last couple of years. Like Roman Reigns gets the biggest negative reaction. Every time he comes out, I, is he a baby face? <laughs> if he's getting the largest heel reaction when he comes out, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that's, Kind of dynamic, and then it comes back to just being able to work. Like, can we flip that? Like, what are we doing? Like, how can we get them back on that wavelength of supporting the person that we want them to support and you know, getting on the ass of the person we want them to get on the ass of? All right, on that note, we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back. We're going to discuss many of the companies that you've worked for here in New England, your opinion on the New England scene and individual talents, as well as just general stuff about Tyler Sindron when we come back on Truth, Justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Way. Are you a wrestling fan, but you've always wanted to get in the ring? Do you want to follow in the footsteps of superstars like Donovan Dijak and Flip Gordon? Then check out the New England Pro Wrestling Academy. At the NEPWA, you can live your wrestling dreams and train at the best pro wrestling school in the Northeast. Check out NEProWrestling.com for information on joining and about their upcoming fantasy camp. It's NEProWrestling.com. Start your pro wrestling dreams today. I'm the president, and as they say, the buck stops here. So I take full responsibility for every one of my illegal actions. But you see, that's not the whole story. And I think each one of you is entitled to the whole truth. And we're back with Truth, Justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Way. We're sitting here with Tyler Cintron. And we're going to go into a little bit, uh, you know, the New England uh, scene in general. You've wrestled for a couple of companies. What was your uh, first singles match? Was it that match you had mentioned earlier with Zach? It was. It was at uh, NCW, the Dedham VFW, um, against Zach Pierre Below. I'm sorry if I'm saying your last name wrong. I, just, <laughs> I can hardly pronounce my own last name. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a fun little eight minute match you know uh got a nice little arm heat in there you know worked me over a little bit uh gave a terrible cutter for a finish uh to the point where picture dave told me to go back in the ring and hit it again after the match um so picture like, dave yeah, giving feedback? picture dave calling shots to me man uh i love you picture dave by the way um yeah, and he, you know he was awesome to work with because I can't remember if he was probably booked to go over because you know I'm a new guy or whatever. And then you see the rabid Cintron crew out there and <laughs> pounding drinks back. He's like, "You better go over." You know, there's no guardrails there, right? And he's like, oh. <laughs> um, "But yeah, I mean that was it, it was a fun night. Um, you know, I got to meet uh, the masshole Mike McCarthy that night. I think he's awesome, very underrated talent himself. Um, but the only thing that was really weird about that night was we have the pre-show meeting and JC's back there and he's like, yeah, I know we're like the 11th or 12th best indie in new England. And in my brain, I'm like, why am I here then? <laughs> you know, like that's, that's not adding up. And that, I mean, that's cool. Those guys are going to do their thing. I got a lot of friends that, you know, people I'm friendly with that work the shows. I know cash who's done it. AG goes back and that's fine. Let them do their thing. It's just, I can't have that mentality. I've never had it. I'm never going to have that mentality. Don't ever like, yeah, that's good advice. Don't ever start your show and tell your, your group of workers, we're like the 11th. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we kind of suck, but we're good enough. Yeah, that, that can honestly. Wait, is he talking about the company or is he? The, yeah, he said the 11th. He the wind or, out of his sail. Yeah, 11th or 12th best <laughs> Indian New England. Why on earth would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> and I, it, there was, I mean, there were some talented folks there that night, too. That's where I was like. I don't know about that. I mean, well, they're probably basing it on their draw, their popularity, not just the talent. I mean, there are some talent that can probably drag you down, but yeah, you're right. That's that's the first thought that any wrestler should have had after that line was, where the fuck right. am I here then? Well, it was funny because we talked about wrestling fans like being in, you know, and yeah. so I got, you know, my 30 people hammered screaming and we're, you know, it's a double down spot and I'm like, well, they're like, they're not making any noise. And it's like saying, they're like, God, they're like, why are you on the ground? So I'm like trying to get to the wrestling fans and they're not having any of it. So it was like the most awkward quiet double down of all time <laughs> well we're the uh well the 11th best uh podcast uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? listen if you want i don't care what? 
I, I don't want to harp on it because this is the feel good episode. What a fucking idiotic statement. <laughs> I don't, not supposed to fire up your locker room. <laughs> hey, guys, uh, strive to be 11th best. <laughs> <laughs> Give it your best, yeah. but uh, if we suck, it's expected. <laughs> good God. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to go over some of the uh, New England companies you worked for. Uh, I hear you had a one night only with Lucky Pro Wrestling. I did. I uh, got to manage uh, the lovely Avra Everett. Um, funny story is, you know, AG uh, has, knows everybody and is loved by everybody. I've never seen anything like that in wrestling. So I hit up Chris Sullivan. I'm like, yep, I'm you know new in town. AG can be a reference. Like hit him up. And he just kind of gave me like some short answer was like, nope, show's full. And I was like. Oh, okay, like, I don't, if you don't want an upper mid card heel, that'll put people over pretty good. Like, what was uh, it like? Shows full or this show's full, but we might have something. No, there was like <laughs> nothing for the future. And then, <laughs> so I'm here one night talking to AG about it, and you know, <laughs> Evie's you know like I gotta work here. Like I don't know if I can, you know. And I'm like, oh. AG's like, well, why doesn't he manage you? He can get heat. Like he, that's mm. what he does. So I was like, yeah, man, I hit up Chris. And I was like, it was a no-fly zone. And then 20 minutes later, AG hits me up. He's like, yeah, your book's Saturday. Because, <laughs> you know, him and Chris are boys. Yeah. I don't know if you <laughs> guys just, knew that He mentioned not. that on our podcast. Uh, now, I want to touch upon that, actually, because Chris Sullivan had stated that his company, he really likes to book the young guys who are trying to come up and make a name for themselves and stuff. You're a young guy. I mean, you weren't really known in New England. That doesn't really fit his narrative here. I don't know. Maybe I rubbed him the wrong way at some point in time. Wouldn't be surprised if that was the case, but I don't know how I would at that point in time. Mm-hmm. I mean, now I go to every Lucky Pro show because you know, our guys are on there. Yeah, you yeah, go there yeah. and support and you know, run up the bar tab a little bit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Can we do some uh, investigative? Were there any shows prior to this that you worked with similar talent that you may have rubbed the wrong way, went back and told Chris? Maybe. Uh, I think I was pretty well behaved at NCW show. Okay. Well, it's weird because when I was a booker, I don't know if I ever mentioned uh, I was a booker. <laughs> Even if I had no intention of booking you, I would always leave the door open and say, oh, this show's full, but give me your number, give me your contact, right. maybe. I, I just saying, flat out, nope, show's booked. <laughs> Leaving it, that just is so, not only weird, it's just kind of like shitty to me. Like, why wouldn't you... At least say, hey, we might have something in the future. Yeah, it, I'm not trying to like stir the pot with that one. I'm just like telling the facts. Like it was a little bit confusing to me you know, for the same thing. Like he said, like up and coming. Like yeah. I was perfect. Well, got a guy that's got a look. Like he can bump his ass off for somebody. Who do I want to make look like a million dollars? Well, yeah, that's the thing. You can cut a promo. You have a great look. Um, you're a good heel. Put one of your baby faces with you and get you over or use you for a consistent managing spot like they're doing with uh, Rob Echoes and WWE and NXT yep. right now with Chelsea Green. Just, if that's the route they want to go, it doesn't matter. But in, And I agree with Tarzan. Leave the door open. That way you're not limited to being like, well, I already told this guy to go fuck himself, so yeah, I, I mean, can't I, use him ever again. I feel like it's all good because I've talked to him at his shows. You know, we say hi, we're friendly, super cool. I got, I have no hard feelings. Yeah. I hope to God he doesn't either. Um, but they had their Rumble show, and you know, notoriously the Peanut Gallery, red and blue, is at the bar, um, and they may have had a little spot where uh, <laughs> Peanut Gallery, <laughs> what color shirt does he wear? Blue <laughs> went in there and helped out Charlie Cashew, but to uh, no avail, unfortunately. <laughs> Wait, terrible. <laughs> Were you booked in this rumble even? Well, we kind of pitched <laughs> ideas out there yeah. where, you know, because you always have like the goofy ha-ha spots. Yeah. So. We pitch it out there, and you know, we're there. We have a few drinks. Like We're there to support Cashew and get on Archer, and Archer's unbelievable as a heel, by the way. I don't know if you guys have seen some of his heel stuff from Lucky Pro, no. but it is great. I'll have to take a look, because everything I've ever seen, he's got the personality of a wall right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll send you a match from Vermont Please. that'll change change your perspective okay. on it. Um but no, so you know, we're pitching and we're kind of like ha ha in it, and you know, I'm brothering AG because of the amount of times that he said they were boys on your guys' show. <laughs> like that is the entire reason why I'm doing it. I'm like, AG, he's like, no, I always pitch stuff to him on like the days of shows, and I'm not gonna be there that day. I'm like, come on. So I d I don't know exactly how it happened, but Chris comes up to me, me and Chase, he's like, We really gonna do this? And we're like, Yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> so it was I don't know, we it was kind of awkward though, because we're standing there. He's giving us the Iggy like it's next. So I'm like, okay, we're going to do rock, paper, scissors. And then, you know, we're going. Chase, we had it rigged. I separated my shoulders, so I wasn't going to go in there and yeah. mess it up anymore. Ask Fury that story next time you talk to him. He'll tell it better than I do. <laughs> um, 
So he's like, give us the Iggy, and then somebody's music hits. So we like do our rock, paper, scissors spot. And everybody's looking, it's like, why are those guys playing rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, I think it was like seven or eight ended up, uh, but they did the spot where you know Chase was eliminated, then caught Cashew, and then I put him back in, and then Peanut Gallery Blue came back to hang out with Peanut Gallery Red by the Peanut Gallery. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, APW, our, our former guest, Michael Morris. Yeah, uh, I've had the time of my life working for APW, the two shows that I've done. It's fun. Um, you know, uh, me and Robo had a nice little eight-minute match, I thought. Um, it was fun actually setting that up because I know Robo likes to do a lot of things. And I'm like, nah, man, you are a house. Like, you are a hoss. Trust me, less is more with this one. Kind of had that traditional, again, like kind of my wheelhouse, that traditional eight-minute match. Put somebody over and make them look strong. And we did. Um then the second show, uh, was me and me and Walbridge again, um, doing our thing, um, with yeah, we actually got to work Mike McCarthy and Robo that night, so that was a lot of fun. I mean, it's great; they pay you when you walk in the door, and you can leave when you're done. Yeah, so I'm all in. For yeah, that. And I, the show starts at like six thirty. I wish awesome. I had to work for Atlantic Pro yeah. more. All right, uh, you worked for AG's company, zero one Northeast. I love it. I love every second of it because AG's intelligent enough to know like my exact strengths and puts me in those exact positions. Doesn't ask me to do anything that's outside of my wheelhouse, right? Like last show, tournament, me and Demon, I run terrified of him the whole time. Me and Eastman work a double count out with him. Working with Eastman is awesome too. Like we just have that good chemistry, um, you know, especially a couple guys that can talk like we can. Yeah. It's just... It's that perfect. It, if there's a perfect role for me, it's that one. And of course, you look at it like you know Heenan with Rude and Perfect. Um, but you want to talk about like locker room culture and all that stuff. Like that's great too. Like I've had zero negative experiences with that. Like from the first show to you know them bringing in Lanny Poffo and Danny Davis and bumping us around, which was fun. A couple of Ring of Honor guys coming in. It's just been awesome and fun and it feels like he books his shows like entirely two people's strengths which probably isn't easy to do and i know evie does a ton of ton of uh work on that too so it's not just ag show it's a uh, it's a lot of evie too i think she ran that last one by herself because he was in germany wow really yep good for her well he did credit her on the podcast of being like his partner he didn't have heavily. heavily yeah he did give her good. credit for that i don't know uh he, her running the show, though. I mean, I don't know if all the boys are going to listen to... Well, she ran the pre-show meeting. Uh, I think, uh, uh, well, Randy and Chase helped out quite a bit, too, oh, okay. but she was on point. She was Vince. That's not she a knock on her. It's just, you know, how often in indie wrestling is a woman running a show telling you what to do? Not many. You can stop being sexist about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 2020, my man. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying that it just it's not common is all I'm saying. Yes, I agree with you. But I think people are more open minded nowadays where even if someone like uh Ava Everett is running the show, then But it's kinda it's okay. well, this is a girl who was on our podcast and said she doesn't really judge her match on if the crowd reacts or not. <laughs> that so is true that's too. Kind that's of also a big uh, mistake. But that was <laughs> that was well, a year ago or so. So yeah, yeah, maybe almost. she's learned. Well now they run shows without a crowd in it anyway. Yeah, that so, is you know? true. So <laughs> I guess maybe she was right all along. So. <laughs> All right, XWA, you're the former Firebrand champion. I know, former is heartbreaking. I thought we were going to pull Brian Fury back down there on a Thursday night to reclaim the throne. Um, no, I owe Mike a lot because, you know, I talked about the struggles of getting booked a little bit up here. Um, but Mike literally was like, yep, we can put you on shows. I mean, like I said, I've known Matt for years. I know Matt has a good relationship with Mike. I'm sure that had something to do with it. Um, but I know AG had me outreach to Jose Perez and – professional awesome all the way through um i know sometimes on thursday nights it's not the best wrestling but it's a you know it's people that are up and coming it was an opportunity for me to get reps um you know and, and through those channels and being going down on thursday nights i've gotten to work with people like anthony henry uh, i got to work with mike verna still waiting for those payoff matches to come because we're like yeah we're just gonna keep it super basic because i feel like there's gonna be two or three more and then covid19 took over the world <laughs> <laughs> so i'm waiting for those to happen um and xwa is another one of those companies too like i know who that was before i came out here like there was two companies that were like this is what i want to do and it was chaotic and xwa so yeah i love every second of it yeah i'm trying to get him on the show so uh Antonucci? Put, yeah, put a word in for it. Right, well, he was actually one of the first people we reached out yeah. to when this podcast this guy, started. He's running away from me like he owes me money. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, and finally, pretty much your home company, Chaotic Wrestling. Yeah, uh, I mean, what's there to say? I mean, the the name carries all of the weight, right? The ten year dominance, like we just talked about, is going to be Cold Fury nineteen, nineteen years. <laughs> of- yeah, them and Top Rope are the only companies I believe in New England that have been. Um, 20 or 20 more years right and you just look at the the products that have been kicked out from them. like even now like some of the best independent wrestlers on planet earth are you know working the main event of cold fury you know josh and ag are there now verna is right there as well i mean christian's probably going to take over the world as soon as it gets right again i mean it's just it's just top level competition from head to toe like i i know there's like that stigma and i talked to chase about this like it's not like a negative type in that locker room but there's a standard that you need to live up to if you're going to be on those shows like it's not going to be bad they're just not going to book you because you train here like you have to bring something to the table you actually have to be able to do something in the ring so that's you know that's kind of where i think some of that stigma comes from is just that expectation of yes it has been that good and it's going to continue to be that good it's funny you bring that up because it's a common problem i always saw when my time in wrestling is a lot of companies it's like it's not you're not booked because you're good enough to be on the show. You're just booked because you know someone or you're trained or the promoter booker just wants to be everybody's friend. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think either one of those guys want to be anybody's friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I talked about it earlier, you know, like I was, I walked in, you know, I walked in, I should be working JT in the main event for the strap, former <laughs> championship wrestling from Hollywood TV champ guys. Come on. <laughs> Um, and just that like time frame because again, it didn't matter that I had seven years of experience at the time and could go a little bit. Like I brought nothing to the table for those shows. Like there was no substance. Like it could have just been a countdown spot and then we're gone and we're back into oblivion or whatever. Or disappear like that Mercon kid. Mercon, if you're listening, get your ass back to training. Who? The John Mercon. Remember he had he was uh he's got Muscles like he was literally like has a physique and a look. I don't even remember who we're talking about. Came out as like Thaddeus something the fourth. I'll show you a picture. Yeah, please, because my if you know, I'm sure you listen. (laughs) No memory. But do you feel in New England that's still a problem? With uh, we got 50 guys on a show because the promoter doesn't want to say no or he wants to be everybody's friend. Oh yeah, I mean I think that's plagued across the entire independent wrestling scene. You know and. talk about mike like I, I love the way he runs saturday shows but sometimes on thursdays it's like well who do we have and i remember one night there was a lot of bodies in that locker room and i'm like wow <laughs> like there was a lot and then you're just having random it's like wrestlemania 2000 like you have all of these bodies and you have all these like matches that just don't ever go anywhere to do anything not a single singles match on that show the wrestlemania 2000 wasn't like x-pac and kane a singles match no, on the x-pac and kane wrestle i was Kane and Rikishi versus Xbox in the road. That's dog. what it was. It's ridiculous. <laughs> what a weird match. There wasn't like a short women's match on that. I feel like you would there, remember a good there women's is. match. There, <laughs> <laughs> right. There is one. It's the cat Terry Reynolds versus the cat versus Terry Reynolds in an evening gown match with Val Venus as the guest referee. Perfect. With Moolah in one corner <laughs> and the young the other. That's the only singles. <laughs> match. A lot of women in that. You know an awful lot about that match. <laughs> <laughs> Val Venus uh, wearing a shirt. Where Val Venus is written income. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try doing that in 2020. That's a good design. <laughs> yeah. Plays to the character. New Cintron shirt coming soon, folks. <laughs> Cintron income. So we're going to talk about Chaotic. Let's talk about the marketing department. Yourself, Richard Holiday, Evan, what's the last name? Wal- it's Wal- Wal- Walbridge. Please don't confuse him with that Mark, Elia Markopoulos. <laughs> it's Evan Let's wait till we get to the so fantastic So how did this all uh, come about? Um... I say I'm a big fan of all the stuff I've seen of the market. Yeah, so I, I don't know the exact origin of it. I know through talking to Holiday, I know it's kind of like, you know, we all have these ideas and whatnot. And I think he's always kind of had this marketing department concept um, within. And if you remember the promo I cut for the countdown, I'm in like a suit and tie. So it kind of naturally fits and can be in that lackey heel is where I belong. Um, and then... Um, I know Walbridge just came in out of the blue, um, <laughs> but I know they were, you know, he was looking for something else at that time too. And I think it, it just worked, right? Like it was just kind of a concept that 
look great on paper and then organically came together like all the way through like we all kind of knew our roles and what we wanted out of it you know i didn't we we knew holiday was that guy in it i didn't want to be the guy in it uh i love those interactions with wall ridge because i can make them whatever i want to be and to get those points across like i think the one we cut after summer chaos where holidays going on vacation or something like that like we cut a two-minute promo off the cuff in one take and it just worked so our, our chemistry really was there naturally without, you know, I don't want to say we didn't put in any work, but we didn't have to like go out of our comfort zones. We all just kind of fit within that. Um, and I hope to God someday, somewhere, we get to see the marketing department, you know, run wild and free again. Maybe it might not be in chaotic, might be somewhere else, but holiday, I hope you're listening. We're down for it. How much was you guys and how much was the office? I think the office put it on paper, the concept, but I think they also trusted us to get the promos across and what we exactly needed. Um, because, you know, Holiday can cut a promo, I can cut a promo, they know I'm not going to overstep the boundaries on it and get the message across of what we want as opposed to trying to get myself over. So there's a lot of trust there. And you think that it didn't become all it could have been? I still think there's a lot of meat on the bone. Like, we could still be running that thing now, and we could be running that thing in other promotions. Yeah, I share my opinion unsolicited, but I, I really do think that uh, a lot more could have been done with the marketing department. And I feel like you guys were always given a spot to be a demonstration of a demonstration of character, but were never put in any prevalent. You know what I mean? Like you guys never got put for the tag titles. Uh, the, he never got put for. I don't believe you did. At least so no main events. Is that what? Yeah, you're there was no real main event spots where you guys have a faction that, like you stated. On paper, the image of the U3 looks great. Um, that alone, to me, I, I probably would have pushed you guys way harder than you guys were. I think we might have had a tag title match. I don't know. I can't remember. It's, yeah. I, mean, I know we had a six-man that, you know, would, on paper against the hooligans, which should have just been a banger, but it just wasn't. Something was off in that one. I feel like you guys were there, and that's it. You're yep. just, like, my opinion, because I got to watch the show as I was commentating, you guys were there. That's it. Like, oh, there's a marketing department. All oh. right, moving on. There's also a DL Hearst. There's also a, you know what I mean? Yep. It wasn't like a, this is the culture, you know? This is Killanova Inc. That is Killanova Inc. It was like, here's, we got a DL, we have a Josh Briggs, we have a marketing department, you know? What oh, I mean? yeah, this is the night I wore pants. <laughs> oh, well, my, not my finer ideas. I'm not a big pants guy. <laughs> Well, I don't know how much you want to get into it, but I mean, what do you think went wrong? I honestly, I don't know. I, I would love to figure out where it took a curveball, um, but I'm not entirely sure. I, th I thought it was working just fine. Do you work well with Evan Walbridge? I do. Do you? What about Richard Holiday? I work great with Holiday. Is there any kind of um, how would you say it? Uh, political issues with the office and and you guys or the office and Evan or, or Richard Holiday that you know of? No, I mean, I again, like I talk to Holiday frequently. Every time I see him, we talk about it. And we want to get the marketing department back on par. And as far as I know, the office has been talking to him potentially about something. Maybe not the marketing department, but I mean, I've seen Holiday in the office have conversations at XWA about different ideas to kind of spit it and get it back in, and get it going. So. Did you get to hear any whispers or anything through other than the boys or? Anyone in the office or anywhere in general. There's that, always whispers within the boys, but I'm going to listen to that. Never have, never will. Okay. Um, it just could be one of those things. Maybe we make a dark side of the ring on that. Like, what happened <laughs> to the marketing department one day? Like I said, the, the marketing department is great. You both, you guys can all cut promos. You guys are all great characters. Um, there, there has to be a reason why it hit, fell apart. I mean, do you think you could put your finger on it? Do you think the work was not up to par, the in-ring work? Well, I think the in-ring work was fine. Okay. I just, maybe there was no, like, end conclusion of where it was going to go. So they had no write-off for it or any kind of plan for it, so they just squashed it? Yeah, I think it was Holiday that came up with the Loser Leaves Town match. Really? Yeah, if I remember correctly through talking to him i could be mistaken by that yeah but i remember him talking like being excited about it and then like a return i don't know if he wants to be a baby face or not but that won't work well yeah. <laughs> um yeah that's i don't know 
I got nothing for you then. Yeah, in 2019, 2020, I don't try to get involved in the rumblings and rumors. I just try to stick to what I know from what people have told me, and that's all I got. All right, we're going to get into some questions. Some of it about you specific, some about just New England in general. Um, we'll have some fan questions we'll as well, fan as always. questions as well. Well, the first question I would ask, what would you say is your best experience up to this point in New England? Ooh, probably that reaction at the countdown, right? We've mentioned it a few <laughs> times. Like, that's pretty cool, uh, having that. Um but also winning the Firebrand title was pretty cool too. You know, it was it was a nod from somebody that was like, okay, yes, you can still go. You bring something to the table for us. Um, you know, tried to create that as like a workhorse type Thursday night title. May not have gone exactly how I wanted it to go. Um, but definitely number one was that reaction at the countdown and kind of the arrival of the Cintron character. And on the flip side, what do you think's the worst? The worst. Well, wow, that's a great question. Probably, and I hope JC doesn't take this the wrong way, but, you know, 11th or 12th best, <laughs> right? Like, that was, that was, like, the only time I was like, do I really want to get back into this? Yeah. Probably that comment from the, the locker room meeting. Yeah. I mean, that would probably be the only time where I was like, oh. Well, maybe he learned from his mistake, because, I mean, I think Tarzan and I agree that's a pretty stupid line to tell your roster before show. Not Obviously not now, because of COVID-19, but. New England is a very heavily saturated area. There is a lot of companies. Do you think there's too many or do you think there's just enough or do you think there could be more? So a few years ago, I've probably been like, nope, there's too many. It should just be the good ones. Cut them out. But at the end of the day, if somebody wants to put on a show safely with people who can be safe in the ring, like they might not – main event might not be Josh Briggs and AG, but, but if it can get two guys to go out there and perform safely – on a Friday, Saturday night, I'm actually okay with it now. Um, you know, shifting the mindset of I got to get to FCW, I got to get to NXT to, you know, I just want to put on good quality wrestling. It might be some people and all they want to do is just be the local guy that wrestles at a Dedham VFW forever. And that's cool. That's their thing. If they can do it safely, um, I have nothing against it. Um, social media is a big part of oh, yeah. not only the world, but wrestling as well. Do you think that's had a, a negative impact? Not, in New England, but wrestling in general. No. Um, Do you think wrestlers are like, what I'm getting at, are wrestlers too accessible now? Is there no line between fan and wrestler anymore? Probably not. I mean, you know, even like the, the running joke with me and Ziggler, right? Like one of the best Brian Fury stories I'll ever tell is I was at one of those shows in Lowell and I stand by the monitor and I watch the entire show because I like watching wrestling and I usually steer clear of him on show days. He's, he's Fury, you know, he's... Stay out of his way. So I'm sitting there standing with my arms folded and I'm looking at the monitor and, you know, he just turns around. He's going to do something. He just stops. He looks at me and goes, stop tweeting at Dolph Ziggler, you fucking loser. And like carries on like completely unjustified or warranted. But I, I guess to that point, like speaking from somebody who's in the ring now, but also a fan of somebody like that, like I wouldn't say it's too accessible, but there can be open communication, right? Like, you know, it's kind of a running joke that, yes, I do get quite a bit of an interaction out of Ziggler on Twitter. It's been like that for 10 years. It's kind of just a fun ha-ha thing. Like, he knows who I am. He knows I'm, like, the biggest fan on planet Earth. Some mutual friends that we have have very much clued him in on that. Um, so I, I guess it depends. I mean, a, a fan can send me a Facebook messenger, and, you know, if you're sending it to – you can tweet at me all you want and you're going to get a Cintron response. But if you're sending a Facebook message to me, like I'm probably just not even going to respond to be honest. So I don't know if it's as accessible. I mean, it is, but it isn't at the same time. I, it's probably on the, the worker themselves. Would you, if you ha really had to choose, would you like to go back to the point where you were slightly inaccessible to the point where people believe the Tyler Cintron character is who you are? Or are you okay with the line blur? It is, knowing Tyler Cintron isn't exactly the same as... I would rather separate it all. Really? Yep. I would rather have Tyler Cintron not be accessible and Paul Grosskreitz with his private life and his dog be private from anything to do with wrestling. And no one would know that you are, you know, mentally or the way you perceive yourself is two different people. You'd want them to think that they're the same people or you you said you're okay with... I'd rather have it be two separate entities. Okay, so you wouldn't want people to think like... Tyler Cintron is Tyler Cintron. He just now has a dog. Yeah. Really? And, but at the same time, too, like, 
I'm on Facebook as Paul Grosskreutz, and I'm sharing the shit out of every you know event that I'm on mm. to get my friends and family to come because that's how it's accessible these days. So that's where it's like I don't know if there's a right answer to the question. That is a great question, though. I guess what the question I'm asking, really, and I, I guess I'll reword it because in my head I feel like I'm not asking it right. Um, are you okay with fans nowadays knowing that you're Paul playing the character of Tyler Centron, or would you rather them think – the character Tyler Centron is who you are. I would rather them think that Tyler Centron is who I am, but that's not the case anymore. Like even so Dolph Ziggler for the 18th time on this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> working our way up to 24 because it's the 24th episode. <laughs> this is a feel good podcast. We're going to talk about Dolph Ziggler, <laughs> but he's on Twitter is Nick Nemeth. I didn't know that. A lot of the WWE guys are real name now. Yeah, and that's the that's kind of where I'm getting at is if uh, and I brought this up the last episode, but Braun Strowman actually has on his Instagram, I am so and so playing the character of Braun Strowman, right? And I always want to know like what people's mindsets are. If you want to be known as, if you would like, if it was a time and place in this day and age that you could be known as just Tyler Centron, or are you okay and w- want this to continue as I am Paul playing Tyler Centron? No, I'd rather just be Tyler Centron. Um, you brought up the promos and whatnot. And for a long time, this business is one of the most, the number one talent was talking people into the building. Do you think that's still prevalent today or do you think that's a lost art? I think like it's, Hulk Hogan, yeah. Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair. These were, these were guys, the rock, they could talk people into buying a ticket. Well, I think like, even you look at WrestleMania last weekend, right? Like, what did we tune in to watch? I don't know. I don't, you said you didn't watch it. I didn't it, watch it this year. But Julian, we watched because it was WrestleMania. Yes, that's it. That's it. You know what I mean? We, I didn't. If Ziggler wasn't even booked on the card, I would have watched it. If there wasn't a Boneyard match that intrigued me, mm-hmm. I was still going to watch it. So I think the wrestling is the draw more so than a specific individual. But at the same time, you might sell a few extra tickets if you have somebody like MJF on there because it's super intriguing and it might ignite something from somebody or you have a retro ag that you know has this awesome gimmick and you kind of want to come check that out so i don't know if it's as prevalent as it used to be i would not on a grand scale you know not let me tell you something brother (laughs) you know on friday night at 7 p.m at the boston garden dude i'm gonna be hanging and banging and doing all that like i i think that's gone but creating a personal issue where you can create some sort of video package to get people's attention and like justify some sort of emotion that would be more so than that old school promo brother. That's a good example actually, because I being a fan probably would have never cared to really check out chaotic wrestling after I was done wrestling. But when AG had the video packages and the the new gimmick coming out, that honestly did attract me to the point where I was like, eh, I want to tune in more. Yeah. So I think if you, you're you correct, if you do it right, that can still happen where you create a character and more or less talk people into a building. Well, because even you look at Danhausen as a prime example. I don't know if you guys follow him on Twitter, but Who's this? Danhausen, he's got like the face paint and he's very evil. He says no swearing. Yeah, no. Check it out. It's awesome. Okay. It's, but he's, you know, it could be somebody that is brought to. An area that's like, yeah, I'm going to be competing at Chaotic Wrestling Countdown on June 27th or whatever random date it is. I could sell a few more tickets. So using that social media engine could be just as prevalent. But he doesn't get your attention without the promo because they're really good. (laughs) I'll take a look. Do you think, uh, well, today's wrestling, but New England is just the wrestling selling or are there people on the shows that are selling? I guess what these, uh, yeah. you know, like, would people you, buying a ticket because it's wrestling? Or are they buying a ticket to see Tyler Cintron? Are they buying a ticket to see Richard Holiday? Oh, well, they're JT buying Dunn. a ticket to see Tyler Cintron. I mean, <laughs> come on. I, mean, I think we've been over. No, uh, I still think they're buying a ticket to watch wrestling. I think the quality of wrestling is what brings people back, however, because if it's not good and, you know, everybody's been a wrestling fan at some point in time, you know, and this is a good age. Like there's some quality independent wrestling out there, maybe better than it's ever been right now. You know, but if you, you're like, Oh, I went to cold fury seven years ago and you know, I want to go check it out again. Cause you know, wrestling is back and I want to, whatever. And you go and you watch that four way with, you know, Briggs and Verna and AG and Christian, and they tear the house down. You're going to keep, coming back and that's one of the things i do like about chaotic specifically is it's so storyline driven where it's like i gotta tune in next week or i gotta buy a ticket to go to the next show to see what's cooking with that 
And from your experience, what do you think uh, the, today's booker and promoter in New England, what's the top thing they're looking for? Or is it just, hey, I need a body and you know you were trained by Fury? I mean, are they looking for look? Are they looking for talking? Are they looking straight up talent? I don't, or is there anything that they even care about? Honestly, I don't know what they're looking for. <laughs> I, um, you know, I, Referencing back earlier, hitting up all these different people where it's like, you know, on paper, like I have a good look. I can go okay in the ring. I will put anybody over and then some and will actually question you if you ever put me over because sometimes I don't understand why, <laughs> if it makes sense. So, I, I mean, I, I'm assuming people that are trained by Fury get that instant rub because there's a certain – his stigma and like performance level that comes from that. And he's just not going to send you off in the wild if you're not ready for it. But at the same time, it's like, are you just going to book somebody because it's Brian Fury's student and you have a spot? Like everybody probably operates on a different substance. Like again, getting booked in chaotic was because I fit a character of what was needed to enhance a storyline essentially. So it was like almost a casting in a way, you know, like, yeah. Uh, all right, all right, all right. So, uh, in the end of it all, being a guy who's now done kind of like the Midwest area and the you know West Coast, whatever the case may be, um, you can officially go on record because now you have that experience to state New England, you would say, is the best area for wrestling? Without a question. Perfect. But I'd be happy to like politely debate that with anybody. Spirited debate. Spirited if debate. That's the word we like. <laughs> All right. So well, before we get into fan questions, we're gonna, we did this with CJ Cruz. We're just going to bring up some... Uh, People in the New what? England area, get your opinion on A little on bit it. of a name game, if you will. Feel me on my two left feet. Come on. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> all right. And on that note, we're going to start with the man who inspired the question, CJ Cruz. I love Mortar. Again, like he was the one that kind of outreached and said, yep, you are one of us. Um, you know, I know a lot of people like bag on his look, but I think it works. Like a guy that looks like he does shouldn't be able to do the things that he can do. A guy that looks like me probably should, but I can't. Um, <laughs> the only thing I'll say, uh, Negulix, I know we like to get after a little bit. Uh, I think he's got to, you know, let the guard down a little bit. You know, just be part of the boys sometimes. Like we're not out to get you. We want you. We want you to succeed. All right, let's uh, bring up the the man we reviewed your match with, D.L. Hurst. I love D.L. So uh, Dan was actually one of the people that caught my eye when I first started training here. We did the Evolve Tryout seminar last year, Mania Weekend, so we had that experience together. Uh, had a nice little five-minute match, and as kind as you guys were on that last one, uh, I know we may have something in the works for another one in the future that I think is really going to be a great thing for both of us. I love working with Dan. All right, let's go. The man who dropped you on your head, Ricky Archer. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about, you know, a young kid with a physique that walks in and starts turning heads, you know. And I mean, Julian, you've probably seen his progression over the last... From day one, I yeah. watched him walk in and he got... He literally got like a month's worth of training done in like two weeks. And I was like, holy shit, this kid's going to be a prodigy. And, you know, then he tapered off a little bit. But yeah, yeah, I mean, he's progressed, like you said very quickly yeah and spending some time in the car with him going back and forth from xwa and you know being able to have some of those early matches with him where i'm like man i I could do better for him and then eventually like he's you know calling stuff in the ring he's getting himself in prominent spots he's having bangers with cashew against bear country down there like i think it's only a matter of time before we're sliding that name ricky archer up there with some of those commonly themed names that come from here i'll give him this kids a workhorse Absolutely. Has been since day one being in here. And as you're speaking of him, he still is. So. Yeah, dude, watching him bump, I'm just like, man, that's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Snaps and attacks that man. Seriously. Jesus. Julian, you, uh, you know more of the people in the uh, scene today? Throw um, out some names. Let's go a little higher in the food chain. Christian Casanova. Ungodly talented. Like, I don't think he knows how good he actually is. I think he knows that he's good, but I don't think he knows how good he actually is. I hope to God by the time, you know, the world is back, like, from all of this, I know he's probably going to go to Florida and do some stuff Mania weekend, but it's your name out there. Like, he's good enough to be flown all over the country and put on five star matches anywhere that he goes. And uh, what would you say about one of the, you? We'll go both uh, the Bookers of chaotic wrestling chase del monte and brian fury well, obviously chase is mike you know kind of guy with the character what he portrays on screen you know like a sean mike is a bullet the boots, yeah. right? you know? <laughs> uh you know he was nice enough to come down and tag with me against you know archer and cashew a few times at xwa to really you know be in there and be in the ring with me you know coach me through like live being a heel and giving me some of those matches uh both of them actually in woburn um 
you know, when I first got in here to kind of really help establish um, that Cintron-ness, if you will, because I think he saw, you know, we see a lot of things within each other. You know, it's that, it's the Sean tree. I mean, it is who it is. He fell to the Jericho side, I fell to the Ziggler side. It is what it is. Um, and I have an un, like an, a, I can't even put it into words how much I respect and love Brian Fury. Like, I'm not kissing his ass and he knows I don't do that. Uh, but the, just the way that he runs this and the standard that he set and holds to it and doesn't shy away from it, you just don't get that in not even pro wrestling, just like in business in general these days. I got nothing but positive love, if you will, for Fury. You think he'll ever retire and mean it? <laughs> no, he's got to come down and fight me for the Firebrand Championship when I get it back. Uh, what about JT Dunn? JT's one of those guys that I feel is you know the bar setter, right? He's been in the scene for long enough. Again, you know, out west, I knew exactly who JT Dunn or JT Dunn is. Like there was no question. I didn't need to look him up or like what wrestling school you go to. Like I knew who he was. And the first chaotic show. You know, I've heard the the rumblings of MJF, and then that was the main event was JT and MJF, and they tore the house down and just continuously was like, I don't know if the dude is capable of having a bad match. Uh, we talked about a little earlier, Richard Holiday. Love me some Holiday. You know, again, I've got to find our way back to the marketing department. Um, but no, like he's been in the business, what, two, three years, maybe? Uh, he's yeah, still, I think it was two or three when I last talked to him. And still, like that trajectory, I think, you know, everything that you want out of a pro wrestler, size, look, promo, I mean, he's, he's got all those tools. And hope he continues to get his break at MLW. Finally got to meet with his uh, MLW comrade, uh, Hammerstone, when he was out here, which is weird because he's a West Coast guy and we've never met each other until he was out here. Weird. Yeah, we both thought that was weird, too. <laughs> Uh, what about uh, puns galore, Charlie Cashew? Cashew's my guy. <laughs> um, no, but same kind of thing with Archer. You know, we all, I, they were starting out as I was coming in, so I think naturally we all kind of found our way to each other. And again, like, yeah, I just, there's another kid that I don't think he knows how good he actually is. Uh, I feel like he's starting to find that confidence and that swagger in himself. I've noticed, which I absolutely love. Um, but same thing, like you know first match that he had was with me and i loved every second of being able to structure and show him something where it's not like oh i'm just gonna go out there i'm gonna bury him like fuck let's go out there and get you over and just spending time in the car with him and archer has been great what about uh mike verna man i got to throw back a few beers with him at yeah. the last time we were actually able to wrestle um but it's one of those guys you know i always have this like channel in my brain that's always playing the sean bulldog matches on like he beat him for that first intercontinental title that one night only 97 those uh matches in 96 uh the beware a dog Beware-a-dog. and king of the ring those are the type of matches i like to have i like to work with big physical guys because it fits working with a character like tyler cintron and how i envision it on paper uh we got to have that one at xwa and i'm looking forward to many many more over the next couple of years with that guy i'm gonna bring up a few of the girls uh uh, we, we a lot of negative things it said. So let's, let's, <laughs> this is the feel good episode. Uh, a girl that actually is very dear to my heart. Uh, she started when I was still the Booker. I don't know if I ever mentioned I was the Booker. <laughs> uh, Davy Ann, love Davy. I mean, how how can you not? Um, you know, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got to work with her. Me and Walbridge got to tag against her and JT. Um, I was actually looking forward to it because I knew the reaction we'd get. Is I got to do the old Sean spot where you shoot in the corner, lays across the top, and she kicks up, kicks up, kicks up crotch myself and we got a good reaction out of it um and she was super easy to work with and we're actually going to be tagging at one of uh we'll say ag and evie's shows coming up here soon um but i have tremendous talent too and hope she continues to carry on and gets more opportunities let's talk about evie uh, the, I, it's same thing with ag like is if you can you find anybody that has anything bad to say about her i mean even this whole Ava Taker thing, at first you're kind of like, oh, Ava Taker? But she sunk her teeth into it, and she's over with it. She's selling T-shirts. People are chanting it at shows. Throat slash is great. Um, so I think she's just you know, finding her wind with it and finding her own way through. And you know, she's really starting to stand on her own, which can't be easy you know, when you're as tightly affiliated with AG in and out of the ring as she is. I will say this. Um, I fucking hate that Ava take a gimmick with a <laughs> flaming passion, but it works to her credit. You're hundred percent right. She has stayed away. Like not listen to the hate. That's the thing that people do in wrestling. They hear that the boys don't like it or that insiders hate stuff. 
and they quit on it. She has committed to it 110%. She has not let her guard down on it. And like you said, now she's selling merch based on this shit. Right. So, I mean, all I can do is respect her for her tenacity. And uh, former chaotic champion, I believe her name is Tasha Steele. Right? Tasha Steele. Yeah. Uh, haven't had a whole lot of interaction with her. I love watching her work, though. You know, I mean, that's tried and true. I mean, since I've been here over the last year, I've seen she's had opportunities at Impact, Ring of Honor, and NWA, and coming up here and putting on awesome matches with Chris Statt. But yeah, not a lot of interaction, but obviously a huge fan of her work. I know Tarzan, you're not the biggest. It's a feel good episode. Hold Check on. out some of her stuff. It's a common misconception. <laughs> I don't have a problem with women's wrestling. I actually enjoy it more than my co host. Oh, it's the intergender stuff. stuff. I don't like intergender yeah. wrestling. Yes, I do not like female wrestling or women's wrestling. It's. Uh, it's not for me. I, I like. I, I feel like they don't have control of their body. Now, um, another woman I want to mention is Angel Sinclair. So Michelle's been nothing but a sweetheart to me the entire time through. Um, obviously, I think she had an injury of some sort that happened in December. Yeah, I don't know a whole not, lot about it. Yeah, I don't really know too, but too I, much. But you know, I think the more that she gets out and away from the Platinum Honey thing, like that same what show where I hurt my knee, like one of the things that jumped out to me was she came out to Queen of the Night by Whitney Houston and like owned the crowd. I was like, wow, she did the same at one of the APW shows. So mm-hmm. I think... And she has awesome gear too. Like I said, black leather. You know, I'm that, pretty sure she makes her own yeah, gear. Which even more power to you. Yeah, I mean, maybe she needs to make some of my rock star stuff. I want to have coming up. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna be the edge ripoff now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Um, but I mean, she's been great too. I mean, like I said, like Queen of the Night, owning the crowd, finding her way past the Platinum Honeys thing. It's working for. Her. All right, so we're gonna get. Two more questions popped into my head. Right. Well, one I've had, right. I've been holding back for a long time. This one, we had asked CJ Cruz this. With social media and Twitter and YouTube, do you feel today's wrestler in New England would take less money to get more hits on YouTube? Yes. Definitely. Uh, no <laughs> no doubt about it. Snap answer. <laughs> didn't even yeah. think about it. Yeah, I mean, because that's where everybody wants to go. I mean, that's Beyond's thing, right? It's... It's the first thing you hear about beyond is the YouTube subscribers and the views and the hits from it. I mean, you guys, even last week, you Tyler Cintron versus DL Hurst, 1.3 hits. Yeah. Like it's become like part of it. And it comes from ad sponsorships and whatever. I don't, I don't know if it leads to more long-term bookings. Me personally, I could care less about YouTube views. Like put, you know, put money in my bank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I mean, that's what I care about. But I think in general, people would rather have the YouTube views and hits and shares and likes than – anything else and um how come you haven't wrestled for beyond wrestling have they not reached out to you have you not reached out or? uh i mean drew had were you there that night when drew had the i wasn't here but i i known it was happening oh yeah. or maybe it was i don't know so it was essentially you know a, a show here between the students and got to work with cj and we had a pretty good little match you know and drew complimented you know that being some of the best work that he's seen cj have but you know, I'm a I'm a good hand. We just don't know what the hell Tyler Cintron is because yeah, and we didn't get into it much earlier. But I was a poor man's MJF there for a while. You know, kind of. <laughs> in all actuality, it's funny because I worked Kevin Blackwood. He's one of the Buffalo guys, and he actually yelled that at me in the ring. And I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was you know we're kind of steering that character back. Like we still don't know what Tyler Cintron is. Like Julian, you've been at CAC shows. What is it? Is it just a guy that dresses up and? Yeah, I mean, if, I, if Tyler Centron to me is just one of those guys in the world that's full of himself. I mean, but you've seen that character, like they're saying, you've seen that character a hundred times. Right. You just need to evolve. Because, like I said, you're good at delivering. You just need to evolve Tyler Centron. But, yeah, it's just a guy who's full of himself and thinks he's better than everyone. And Exactly. And, you know, Beyond's got a different, unique, like, what's going to jump out? Like, I know you guys watched CJ and Alec Price. Like, that was highly highly praised and reviewed from you know everything in the world to help those two carry on with you know what they got going i just i'm not gonna put on that style of match yeah. you know what i mean like i gotta we gotta figure out what the cintron character is before you know i'm banging on drew's door so much all right so i promise this is my last question before. <laughs> <laughs> let's keep going this question isn't really to you this is more for both you but i was it this is the first time i've had an opportunity to bring this up i watched um the dark side of the ring documentary on the brawl for it all and it got me really to thinking. There was a time in wrestling where, like, a majority of the wrestlers were like really like were, were legit badass motherfuckers. Like these were guys that could tough guys, tough guys that either legit had like some athletic background in boxing or MMA or guys that might not have, but they would fuck shit up. You think there's anyone in New England that really is legit like a tough guy right now? 
I just Julian, I would ask you the same thing. I'm just it just really got into my head watching it and since I have a podcast, a forum to broadcast this thought, yeah, I mean, I'm going to do it now. I wouldn't want to fuck with Josh Briggs. I mean, he's a D1 football player. I'm sure he can hold his own. I mean, when you play on the offensive line at a high level like that, you got to have some sort of... There's a lot of guys I, I know can take a beating. Like, I can take a beating. You can beat the fuck out of me, but I, I wouldn't describe myself as someone that could kick somebody else's yeah, ass. Yeah, I was going to say, so. like, he, you'll survive a punch in the face from me, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's I'm wondering, yeah, like, guys that legit, like, you would think twice about fucking with in real life. Well, so here's the thing. A lot of that is... And sometimes you never know because it's deceptive. So. That's what I was going to say is a lot of it is based on the image you portray. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to use him as an example because to this day, I still don't know really if I could fight him or not is Tommaso Ciampa. He always came yeah. off as a guy that I was like, I feel like he could really fuck someone up. You know what I mean? And for all I know, he's a teddy bear. But And this is not a knock at him. But and it may be because I know him, but I don't look at Josh Briggs the way you do right now. I looked at Josh and I look like I'm like, I'm not saying he can't handle himself, but he doesn't come across as that guy that I'm like, I wouldn't want to fuck with him. Well, I was you just know? thinking of people's like backgrounds. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, who they yeah. are. And like, you know, Dr. Death is one guy that shows that your background really don't matter because <laughs> that dude was a fucking had everything under the sun and got knocked out within minutes. So. Um, yeah, but you're talking one match. It's, not, I it's true. It's, it's one fight. I'm not saying that everyone's based on, but like there are certain people that I look at and I'm like, eh, like honestly, like someone like Brian Fury, he's 50 50 for me because I've seen him shoot wrestle with people because he used to wrestle in high school and or, or whatever. And so he's a guy that I'm like, yeah, maybe, but there's other times where I'm like, no, you know, chase, I don't see him as a fighter, but I guarantee he could fucking scrap. You know, Brian know. Logan, not like, a guy I would fuck with. No, I was just going to say, like, those were the next names on the list. Was yeah. the Logans, both of them. Yeah. Matt Logan seems a little more uh, laid back. Brian Logan, I feel like, would legit one hand on top and bottom of my head snap my neck, no problem. Like, yeah. it just, they're just, it's just the way that you, they carry themselves. It's not really a much. I was looking, it was just to me more an interesting thing to pop into my head. And this is the first episode I've recorded since it's popped in. So I was like, oh, let's bring this up. Let's get. Let's get some two cents on Nick that Gage. I'll never say a negative thing about him. <laughs> <laughs> but like the Ray, for example, we talked about. A lot of people don't know him. Ray can handle himself. Like I saw him wrestle Tough Gagnon, and uh, you know it was pretty. Uh, it was a pretty scrappy little thing. So I'm just saying, it's like I just want to know. You know, it does anybody because a lot of people have the persona, but. Having the persona and actually being legit are two completely different Yeah, things. just like trying to jump down some of the locker rooms I've been in. And no offense to anybody, if you are a legit badass, I just, I wouldn't know. And to, please don't prove it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I can run faster scared than you can, man. I can yeah. guarantee you that. <laughs> That's a fucking great line. Um, yeah, I mean, I can, I'm with Tyler. There's a lot of people that I don't look at. And I don't look at locker rooms nowadays and go, that dude's a legit badass aside from Nick Cage, that I need to stay away from. I just, yep. and you're right. It's, you don't have to prove it to me. Um, I'm sure I don't give off that image in any way, shape or form, but I mean, it's no secret that I've trained in jujitsu and Muay Thai and all that stuff. I'm pretty decent at handling myself. I could take a beating. So, it's, you know, it's not a secret. It, yeah. It's just, I'm sure I don't give that image. So I think it's just how people walk around in the locker room and how believable, honestly, their characters are. That's another thing that can play into it is, for all I know, Nick Gage loves to cuddle with unicorns and eats candy and helps puppies on weekends. But He does eat candy. That, yeah. I, was, I was in the car with him for you know a good I mean? 16 yeah. hours. And some people can take a beating like nobody's business, but doesn't necessarily mean they could kick somebody else's ass. Right. So. Yeah. Just curious. If you have a thought on that, go to our Facebook, go to our Twitter. We always like to hear. Let's uh, get your two cents on the subject. All right. We're moving on. We're going back to Tyler <laughs> Centron. Right. You want to ask some fan questions, Let's, right? We're going to go to listener questions. Oh, all right. So we need to run an ad or something before this? I got to breathe. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you've seen any of the listener questions, but I believe we have like 11. I saw Becca's. That was 11. a tough Yeah, one. I believe we have That's like 11. We, uh, I think our record's 14. Cintron we, buzz, guys. Cintron buzz. Yeah, well, we, <laughs> we couldn't get a guy from Jakarta to get one. But uh, all right. So we'll go with the first question is from Jonathan Morse. Again, Not, no relation to Michael Morse. Uh, what are the pros and cons for wrestling during this pandemic? 
I'm interpreting that as being able to wrestle during yeah, this pandemic. I think I don't know if he's aware that wrestling's not going on. Yeah, uh, I would say everybody should stop wrestling, mostly because <laughs> I want to get back to wrestling. And I think the quicker that we actually all do what the CDC and the FDA are guidelining, the quicker we get back. But there's always going to be people that are not going to. So it kind of is what it is. Do I want to get my ass back in there? Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it took me a long time to get that ring rust off that when I came back to the point where I don't want to go through that again, it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so my body is finally callous. So it's bad, but we, we got to wait. We, we all got to do our part. All right. Another question is from you. One of the trainers here at the new England pro wrestling Academy, Scott Gurren, also known as Max Master. Thank you. Uh, uh big Scott. Yeah, or Scott Dizzle. A trainer at the uh, New England Pro Wrestling Academy, if I'm Dizzle. not mistaken. Yes. Uh, how would you or how would you rate your athletic ability? Oh, 10 out of 10. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably a five in there, okay. I, I would say. I wouldn't say that I'm the most athletic guy in the world, but I wouldn't say that I'm not athletic. Um, you know, if I took care of myself a little bit better and did the things that I needed to outside of the ring, I could easily bump up there. But I will say this, Scott, you haven't seen everything that I'm able to do in there. There might be some stuff we're still secretly hiding. You're not going to be looking forward to the next Wednesday class you have with him because <laughs> he's going to put you through the ring and see what you can do. I'll be there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question is from Adrian Bispam. I think I said that right. Uh, who is your biggest influence in the industry besides Dolph Ziggler? Shawn Michaels. Easy answer. I mean, but even outside of that, uh, Randy Orton. I don't know if anybody's seen my tattoo scheme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to talk about yeah. that, which uh, that's actually one of our questions. Um, next question is from Stephen Page. Why and when... <laughs> This is insane. Why and when did you think it was cool to get Randy Orton starter kit? <laughs> Randy Orton tattoo starter kit. Well, it was 2005. <laughs> he had just won the World Heavyweight Championship. The youngest champion of all time. Actually, no, it was. It was 2005 when I got the starter kit done. Um, <laughs> and it was specifically because of Randy Orton. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Um, are all of your tattoos, by the way, based on wrestlers? Uh, I have a Motley Crue lyric tattooed on me. Other than that... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, next one is from Channing Thomas. He is a wrestler in the New England yep. area. Uh, not much of a question, but I would love for him to talk about the pros and cons, challenges and privileges from wrestling in one area, then transitioning to another. We kind of addressed that throughout the podcast. Yeah. Um, I hope that answered your question, Channing, or your, your inquire. Yeah, if you have anything specific to hit me. Well, I would always word it in a way, what's better about What's better here and then what's better elsewhere? Well, shit. You want to know what's better here? So when I was in Vegas or Utah and I was doing shows back and forth, I would drive five hours to do a show and then drive five hours back home because when you live in Salt Lake City, Utah, where else are you going to work? Or if you're in Vegas, where else are you going to work? Like You have to drive places. Even in Denver, I mean, you have to drive maybe to Colorado Springs, but they're not running shows north. There's no like... There's no population that's condensed enough to run multiple shows. So I think a lot of guys are lucky that you can work on a Thursday for whatever company it might be and sleep in your own bed. Friday night, sleep in your own bed. Saturday night, sleep in your own bed. Sunday, same thing. I think I mentioned it earlier, flying to Denver and back, then working in Salt Lake, then flying mm -hmm. myself to California. Southern California probably has that where they have enough of a population in an area down there to be able to do some of that. But I would say that is definitely the biggest one. What would uh, be the pro about elsewhere? Biggest pro, I guess. Well, I'll just tell you how good you are. <laughs> <laughs> Fair, enough. Fair enough. All right. So next, uh, second question from Stephen Page is big fan of yours. To say, <laughs> will you take Julian Starr's advice and never do the zigzag again? <laughs> no. Um, funny story, though. I mean, it was the the day after that match, and, and I think we all kind of felt it that night. Like it was, it wasn't what it should have been. There was a lot of, you know, you mentioned the footwork wasn't sloppy, but briefcase spot breakdown at the end. Right. Like we, that was more story based. Yeah. So, you know, going into it, I actually sat here and talked things through with fury, you know, on it and kind of grabbing the bull by the horns, but something, you know, anybody 
Has anybody else seen a zigzag given by anybody else not named Dolph Ziggler or Tyler? The no. first time I'd ever actually seen the zigzag. Okay, exactly. Wait, really? So it's literally. I mean, <laughs> the first time I've seen anyone but Dolph okay, Ziggler. Okay, okay. Yeah. Is what so I it's. I, I'm not saying it's a difficult move to take. It's just unique to take. And Dan was selling forward when, in all actuality, you know, we just got to snap back with it, and that's very difficult to do that and back so that is 100 percent my responsibility on that but no julian i am gonna master that thing and i'm gonna hit it so many more times that's all i want to know is that you're actually gonna master it because what blew my mind is one of your favorite wrestlers of all time is Dolph ziggler and you couldn't hit his finish and i um i'm okay as long as you are going to master it um one of the other questions is from uh formerly mentioned ray diorio also known as the ray uh he wants to know do you regret getting that God smack tattoo on your belly button? Yes. <laughs> uh, but it, I am in the process of getting it lasered off. We actually had the foundation set to, and so this is a, a side funny story. People, you know, we talked about my bad luck and kind of a bonehead. So getting laser treatments on it, you got to have like a certain time around tanning in between or the pigments will essentially just like fry the pattern in your skin. Well, it's kind of what happened to me. So I stopped tanning and it was, I had it mapped out so I would have the final treatment done and then I could tan like two weeks out from cold fury. So that way I would have, you know, a good tan for it. But I went in and the, the laser removal guy was like, yeah, no, it's just gonna, it's like, all it's going to be is like a white pigment of that same tattoo around your belly button. He's like, will you please tan to get some pigment back into that? So to be determined if that thing's actually going to be gone for good or if I made it worse. <laughs> Okay, and uh, well, I was it a Godsmack tattoo because I thought it was a Batista. That, it's the same thing. Okay, okay, I didn't know that. All right, so this is a fan question that wasn't specifically for you. It was for a previous episode, but I really liked the question, so I want to oh. ask it to you. Have you ever had a match that you thought was going to be the drizzling shits that actually came out okay? Whew. And on the flip side, have you ever had a match that you thought was going to be great and it turned out to be the drizzling shits? Man. Uh, and mostly because of my own performance. Uh, it can be whether yeah, or not I was just gonna say, you so thought that f- the opponent was bad. Or, you know. No, it was uh, it was that first match with Chase. It was my first chaotic singles match. You know, I thought I'd go in there and tear it up, and honestly, I shit down my leg. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, Julian, if you were there that night, but it was which one was this? The first one in Woburn. With would, me and would Chase. You had a, oh yes, I was, it's dude. Bad. Unsolicited, I apologize, but. <laughs> Should have fuck your footwork was terrible. <laughs> a lot of th- that was, I mean, that was like and one of the nicer things you can say. <laughs> I didn't know if your like if it was the chase called too much and it was moving too fast for you because chase tends to love a good run spot and yes, pin spot, um, or if your footwork was just bad. But holy fuck, dude! Like, yeah, I was like. This kid fucking needs a lot of work. And I saw you training here, so I was like, all right. Well. Yeah, I mean, I'll put in the work. I'm not worried about that. But that, yeah. I mean, I would say that was the one where it's like, yeah, that should be really good. I think on paper, you know, you have our similar personalities, you know, similar type characters. The I know what he wants to get across. He knows I'd be able to feed in for those kinds of things. But it was it was terrible. And I remember sitting in the locker room and Chase like coming over and checking on me. He's like, ah, he's like, you're like suicide watch, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, that would uh, definitely definitely nothing on him that night. That one was that was definitely all me. And I might recommend sometimes to go back and watch matches, but don't waste your time with that. One. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I have another question. Or yeah, it's actually a question from Basic Becca, if you. <laughs> will from the new england wrestling area um she wants you to she wants to know will you uh in the game of fuck mary kill you have dolph ziggler <laughs> britney spears nikki six all right so i was sleepless i saw i got a sneak peek of this last night and i didn't sleep because i was overthinking this one right i'll make sure to answer this trick. so we break down the three components of it right okay fuck kill mary right i don't want to kill or marry any of them okay there is one that i do want to fuck and it's Britney Spears. Okay. So we got to go there. Okay. And then the kill one's tough. But we got to go Nikki Six there because you can't kill him. That's been clinically proven. <laughs> he has died and come back. Okay. I guess I could get married to Dolph and just have an open relationship for the rest of the time. But uh, Becca, it took me about seven hours to come up with that answer. Uh, a lot of like journaling of which direction to go, but that's uh, that's what I came up with. All right. And then the final question I have... It's nine, ten, yeah, eleven. Uh, the final question I have, and again, I want to always thank these fans for chiming in on Truth, Justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Ways Facebook and Twitter this time. Uh, 
in asking these questions for our guests. It makes it a lot more fun. Uh, so thank you all. Last one is from Trayvon Jordan. I have to assume yes. you know who this is. I do. Uh, he says, <laughs> Dear Tyler Scantron, <laughs> what is your stance on do rags? How many do rags do you own? If you could share a do rag with one celebrity, who would it be? Would you rather a silk do rag or a velvet do rag? <laughs> Sincerely, Jalen Brandon. Quite an in-depth question about do rags. <laughs> uh, I am indifferent Can about do rags. Uh, deal with this do rag question. Uh, the XWA guys, tag team, uh, party poppers. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. the, the 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 chaotic just used them. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I really liked them. Yeah, they have a ton of charisma. Yeah, like, fucking. One of the did. best reactions we ever got is when I worked one of them in XWA and they beat me for the belt and then we got it back on me and I was almost like, no, we could keep it on this kid. Like, it was an awesome reaction. I was thoroughly impressed by them. Yeah, they're they're good and they're young. Yeah. And they work hard, so that's key. But do rags got indifferent. Um, <laughs> guess we're gonna have to go with velvet by you know by choice of wrestling gear. I don't have any to share. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out why he was so keen on this do rag thing. Very did you, specific yeah, question. Did I don't you know. wear them? Did you? No, did you they comment do. on them? Um, I probably commented on them once because <laughs> before those guys started, I was taking the train down and they were picking me up. Ah. Uh, so I may have said something at that point in time. But God, if there's one celebrity to share one with, a do rag, uh, probably Vince Neil. Why not? Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Why not? Fair enough. Who would you share a do rag with? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know too many people that would wear them. I, I really don't know. I'd probably wear Michael Scott's on The Office when he was prison Mike. <laughs> oh, God. Guess Dr. Evils. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, as always, we could keep going, going, and going, but our time is limited. So, you know what time it is, Julian? It's time for The, the Fantastic, Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four! All right, sir. So, The Fantastic Four is the same four questions that I know you are aware of. So, the first question, as always, sir, with your entire dealings professional wrestling, uh, what would you say you were most proud of? That I came back um, with a different mindset. You know, there was a lot of, you know, championship wrestling from Hollywood. Winning that TV title with that locker room at that time was a pretty big accomplishment for, you know, a kid from small town Wisconsin that broke into Utah. But being able to, like, get my head back on straight and get back to doing something that I love without, like, an underlying reason other than wanting to be really good at it and loving it, I'd say definitely coming back and having a good head on my shoulders this time. All right, question two. What is, if any, your biggest regret up to this point in professional wrestling? That I couldn't get Bob to come bump me in the ring in that final Woburn show. Fury and Chase pressed him <laughs> all day. And I was way, I was so ready. I was ready for the audible. Like, you know, so we had the DQ finish and me and Wallbridge are out there. And I'm like, and the crowd's chanting Bob. And I'm like, there's, there's no way this guy's not going to fly in here and want to do so. Like, I'll take anything. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be, you know, a big boot and a leg drop or like a, you know, a stunner. Or yeah, I, I would have taken anything. But that would be probably the best. Biggest regret in all actuality because that pop would have been something <laughs> pop completely been fucking... unheard of and it would have cemented a chaotic wrestling history moment for myself as well. Just so get you up to speed a little bit and the last show there, you know, Bob, the, yeah, the, the, the bartender. Yeah, they basically yeah, like put him ever, over and yeah. thanked him for everything. <laughs> and there was a bit where he cut basically a promo and they shit on him or whatever. And <laughs> that cr dude, he's right. The crowd would have went fucking insane if Bob had just agreed to do it but they could not break him and get him to do it all right the question we're all been waiting for and the one that i love the most with your entire dealings of professional wrestling who in the business would you say you hate or strongly dislike the most and will you name them? i will name them and there's two of them unfortunately there's nobody in new england though oh, nobody okay. has really rubbed me that wrong way okay perfect so there's a gentleman by the name of Jagger Lane in Utah. Okay. He is that guy that's on Facebook and Twitter about how hard he's working and taking like pictures with you know, workers, you know, as like a fan and posting about all the great advice that Nick Nemeth gave him or whatever like that. And he just, he's living his lifelong dream and he's going to make it to the WWE someday and nothing's going to stop him. I hate that shit. I, if you're doing it, you ain't posting it on Facebook. And I've made that very vocal with him before. He's a nice guy, though. It's just, yeah. just one of those things that rub you. Yeah. Um, 
And his dad got like some inheritance, or he got an inheritance from his dad, and he like blew it all on wrestling. It was just like, dude, I just, you're not good. And some, you know, what I mean, some point in time, you just gotta not listen to everybody backstage out west. And then there's another dude, and he's blocked me on every form of social media. <laughs> so if anybody wants to go ahead and tag him, tell him to unblock me so he can open up these conversations. <laughs> Rob Risen is his name. He okay. is the shit. He's from Colorado. <laughs> he actually lives in Florida now, I think. So he's gotten a few of those NXT nods to you know just get squashed or whatever. Yeah. But this uh, he's the son of a bitch just goes on there like he's a part of the NXT roster and it's all <laughs> this and that and you know he really rubbed me the wrong way because um my buddy Sam or uh Dak Draper the Mile High Magnum he just won the Ring of Honor top prospect tournament. Yeah. No, he'd no. recently he was in NXT he was signed to NXT for a while if you ever watched any of the old Ascension squash matches he was probably in them but okay. nonetheless like he was contracted like yeah. he was there like he busted his ass he was a college wrestler he's a Jerry Briscoe guy he got there he got let go and then like 2 weeks later this Rob Ryzen dumbass is out there like oh how he's there and he's all this and that that guy sucks like I don't know. So it's those two. It's, okay. Don't waste your time looking them up. Uh, <laughs> if anybody's got mutual friends, go ahead and tag them and let them know I say hi. So no one in New England, not even a, even an experience bad enough to mention. No, I mean nothing bad. I guess because nothing doesn't really bother me that much anymore, and I've kind of seen it all and been there and. Nobody's ever going to say anything worse to me than what Fury said. So. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, for anyone who doesn't know, and we actually didn't even know, we asked off uh, off camera, but we're recording off mic. We asked off mic, uh, how long have you been wrestling? Uh, so it was seven years uh, prior to hanging them up, but coming back. So we're officially, we'll say eight years in now. So with you being eight years in, you have enough experience with the what I like to call the bullshit of professional wrestling, and now you don't let it bother you so much. No, in fact, I like to sometimes maybe stir the pot a little bit because I can see it coming. You know, uh, mortars are really easy one to get cranking, uh, so I may just kind of like set that one up a little bit. You know, especially during ring crews, you know, sending you know greenhorns over to ask mortar a question just to watch him yell at him. That doesn't come from me anymore; it's somebody else. Uh, I was say i'm more like stirring the pot on that end now because it just doesn't phase me anymore you know like he, like you mentioned you've been there and done that like you've seen these guys just do stuff that drive you nuts and it, it is what it is it's just i don't get a lot of it and if i see you posting about how hard you're working on facebook i'll probably unfriend you or unfollow you it's that simple now <laughs> all right so this is gonna be kind of a weird question because the state of the world right now but what in life and wrestling does the future hold for tyler syndrome well, me, me and Walbridge got some pretty good momentum going with what we got. Um, going to continue on that path, definitely. I think, uh, you know, we talked about all these different companies. It's actually kind of maybe shifting gears a little bit. You know, I don't want to work three nights a week anymore. I don't want to work Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So maybe toning down that schedule. Still going to be here working my ass off, making sure we can deliver some flawless zigzags that it's going to live for infamy for you forever. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, but, you know, if we look back on this thing in a year, two years, you know, I really hope that when you look at the New England territory, essentially, this is how I still look at it because, you know, big old school wrestling fan and this is our territory to be one of those household names, you know, because somebody could be from Timbuktu and be like, man, it. Cintron in New England or you know they're watching chaotic wrestling because I'm now a household name with that or you know we can get APW cranking and we got something going there I would I think that's what the future holds is being kind of that at Stallworth and that household name for you know some of the we'll call them elite independence that we have going on up here and I do have to ask real quick um, I think I know the answer and I think this is going to be assumed but even if you don't try with the state of wrestling now you, anything can happen even if you're not trying, you said you just kind of want to wind down the schedule a little and just kind of do local, whatever. Let's just say Ring of Honor or NXT or anyone just decides to approach you and say, hey, we like you look. We want you now. Would you turn it down at this time point in your life or would you take it? I'd take it. Okay. I, I think it would be crazy not to for mm -hmm. somebody that's, you know, worked so hard at it forever. But with my dumb luck, I'd probably be like, oh, I'm winding it down. And then they'd call um, <laughs> NXT, obviously, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Ring of Honor probably depends on what you know, the contract would look like, you know, dollars and cents wise, because yeah. you know, like I mentioned earlier, I was working day jobs where I can find myself all over the country and stay in nice hotels. So mm -hmm. I don't like taking steps back. I like putting my dog in bougie daycares and making sure he's got what he needs. So 
probably depend on what the dollars and cents look like. But NXT could probably, because of the long term opportunity yeah. there. But at the same time, you know, my buddy that I just mentioned is under contract at Ring of Honor. And if they had something creative for us to do, do something together, probably be all in on that too. So a lot of it's dependent on situation outside of anything associated with the WWE. And, uh, recent episode, we reviewed one of your matches, and I know people love to stir the pot. Did you get any, hey, they just uh, shit over your zigzag on, uh, on the podcast? No, because I listened to it first. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I was taking screenshots and sending it to my guys. Like, no, they start reviewing me and DL. Let's get right to it. <laughs> the, um, but but, but the, did, did anyone at least reach out and kind of tell you, like, hey, these guys are shitting on you? No. Really? Yeah. I mean... I, do, I've mentioned the people that I'm close with, and mm-hmm. I think they already know that the feedback that I've gotten from that match from individuals here and just mm-hmm. watching it back in general. Um, I mean, it was the same thing, right? The same kind of feedback. Like, it was a decently ran match. Like, got good footwork. Nothing was really sloppy. Mm-hmm. Briefcase spot Briefcase spot took a little too long. Both times. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's the importance of making sure everybody's on the same page. And I think that's where that match kind of broke down a little bit was, you know, I was looking to have kind of that high paced DL Hurst type match and go a little bit. And I think DL was like, no, I finally get to do some fun comedy stuff, you know? <laughs> so I think it was kind of cross firing on that and just, you know, we weren't necessarily, I'd say we're on the same page. We just kind of had a different idea on a few key elements of the match where, you know, you're what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're a small podcast, but sometimes I'm amazed how quickly someone I get a response. Someone upset about something that was said in the show. Well, I, I, but the thing is, is if you were wrong, I might say what, or, what how, but you're not wrong. I mean, that's that was kind of where I'm at now, especially after like being here. Like it's not, yeah, every, like your feedback and critiques are like exactly what I thought when I sat down <laughs> and watched it. I think you both rated it way too high for what it was. Hear that we were too nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, we finally got someone to tell us we're too nice. <laughs> All right, social media, free plug time. Where can people find Tyler Sintron? You can find me at If You Seek Sintron. Uh, no full spelling of the letter or the word you, uh, just the letter. Uh, rip off from the Britney Spears song, If You Seek Amy, for those Britney fans out there on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I am on Facebook, but if you want to keep up with wrestling and whatnot, just find me on social on Twitter and Instagram. Julian, our social media. Plug away. You can find Truth, Justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Way on Facebook. It is a like page. Please stop by Truth, Justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Way. Give us a like. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Pro Wrestling Way. And as always, you can download our podcast on any major podcasting app that you see fit. Please like, subscribe, uh, leave a star rating, give us feedback to make this the best listening experience for you. Normally, I'd say, where can people buy a ticket to see Tyler Cintron, but uh, you can't buy a ticket to see wrestling, period, nowadays. No, so at least what we have on the horizon. Um, I do know I have something at Cold Fury. I know Wallbridge has been hard at work getting that lined up for me. Um, Before APW had to um, postpone or cancel their last event, it was going to be me and Nico Silva uh, for the APW New England title in Newburyport. So I'm assuming that's going to be cranking when we get back. And I know we got a lot of meat on the bone for 0-1 out uh, west there in Winchenden and Gardner. So you can catch me all over north of Boston. (laughs) You think anyone's going to try and do a WrestleMania-type empty arena show? I hope not. I think there might be some theatrics out of it after. I mean, especially after you get a chance to watch the two. Yeah, when I, I finally we'll sit down and watch yeah. it, it's worth it though. I think it's just so unique and different. Like I actually enjoyed them as a wrestling fan because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to be a five star match in front of no audience. I think they knew that those two types of characters and personalities or those matches to put them in those types of situations. I think we might see more of that. Um, it's kind of funny because one of the first things AG showed me was that match he had with Scotty Slade where they're like brawling all over the place. And I was like, Oh, like it can work. So I would say more boneyard firefly funhouse matches coming out of that as opposed to like an empty crowd match. I, Hope to God not. I have every intention of watching it, but my wife doesn't really like wrestling. So we're both working from home. We're teaching yeah. our, her stepsons from home to be like, hey, can I, do you mind if I, for six hours, watch a wrestling show that you don't want to watch? <laughs> Having her say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm going to have to watch it in increments. I think. Yeah. yeah. And outside of that, man, Asuka with her, uh, her vocals during that match uh, is so good. <laughs> yeah. She is insane during that match. Yeah. Doesn't shut up. 
have to watch it. It makes it worth it. Ah, we want to thank you very much for being on the show. We do really appreciate it. Yes, thank you for coming down and recording Thank with you. Us. I hope you'll come back again. Oh, definitely. Maybe I'll start to get in some dirt and get some real juicy stuff and <laughs> bury some people. Please do. Right. Looking at you, mortar. <laughs> 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 oh god i can't even talk all right <laughs> all right and we want to hear from you our listeners go to our facebook go to our twitter if you uh like the interview if you didn't like it if we were too nice not nice enough you have other ideas other questions we want to hear from you at all times as i always say every episode we love a good spirit of debate share your opinion we don't want to have our asses kissed we want to hear what you really legit have to think don't you agree, Julian? Yes, I do, 100%. Please do not babyface us. People only learn from what they do wrong, not what they do right. And we're going to try our best to keep the show from going on hiatus. It's a little difficult what's going on. You might hear some experimental episodes like the review episode we did last week, which we're still not sure yet if we give it a thumbs up, thumbs down, personally. Uh, I'll share my quick opinion on that. I don't think it translated well, but that's my personal opinion. Uh, maybe we'll try where we review and do the after review as well. Maybe yes. we'll give that a shot. If you have any ideas, please give us a call. What would you do, Tyler, if, uh, in the end of these circumstances? Yeah, I think watch alongs are popular. Uh, you know, you could fire up WrestleMania 2000. We could get some live Tarzan hates pro wrestling going. We uh, could you would technically get... do WrestleMania 14 because it was in Boston. We could. You know, we could do great WrestleManias like WrestleMania 9. I'd love to hear you, you know, work yourself up a little <laughs> bit about that. Maybe 11. 11's got some good stuff in it. Oh, my God. That's in Hartford, Connecticut. Yeah, I know. So I know. Uh, it's true. Oh, that's right. Completely New England. Yes. I, yes. I can probably find some gems. <laughs> <laughs> all right so then join us again next time we're, we uh i know you, i know you think it's crazy but this is uh we did not do bi-weekly this is uh, a weekly episode we're gonna try and do as many weekly episodes as possible so always check wednesdays try and subscribe like us and uh you know hopefully we're gonna do the best we can to keep the show from not going on hiatus during this whole crisis everybody stay safe stay well do your social distancing. I hope everything's better. It's the Feel Good episode. Maybe we'll make every episode the uh, Feel Good episode. Until then, join us again for another episode of Truth, Justice, and, and the, the New England, England Pro Wrestling Way. Way.